We will smash the like button on the seas and oceans. We will smash the like button in the fields and the hills. We will subscribe to the channel. We shall never surrender. Recording in progress. Oh, I'm here with uh, Gern Blanston. How are you, Gern? I'm doing well, Pat. How are you? I'm doing really well. <laughs> so see you. Um, we're here to talk. It's great to see you. We're here to talk about this book, Churchill and Orwell, written by Thomas E. Ricks, The Fight for Freedom. But uh, first, I'm going to do a couple of words of business. We're going to smash the like button because you guys like us. Subscribe to the channel. That helps promote the content up the ladder. And I actually have another channel, which is getting really close to monetization. My second monetized channel. So I'll put a description below and I actually learned how to make cards. So I think I'll put a card up here too. And you guys can help me out with that. That'd be awesome. So <clears throat> this book, I read this book because you recommended it, but why right. did you, why did you read this book? Why did you pick this book? Yeah. Great question. Uh, so I, I was familiar with the author. I've heard him interviewed a few times on the radio, probably when he was flacking other books. Um, I follow him on Twitter. I'm not sure exactly why, um, but uh, he, he always has a lot of, uh, I don't know, kind of trenchant commentary. It's not the usual uh, radioactive blast that you get from, from Twitter. Uh, it was reasoned, um, an opinion you, you like to hear on you know, what's going on in politics, world events. He'd weigh in and, and uh, I like to hear what he has to say. So I think I heard him, uh, I, I heard him interviewed on uh, local radio station uh, back when this book came out, which I guess was around uh, 2019 or so. Okay. A and um, so it, it sounded very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And cool. I, I suspect that he wrote it because like a lot of, uh, a lot of people who are historically aware, um, it was an effort to try and make sense of current events because of course, for the previous four years, we were in a kind of a state of national upheaval, which continues to this day. And I think this book was his attempt to, uh, to address that situation through historical figures. Then what would they, what can they tell us about that moment? Well, that's what history does best when it does that. Um, but I thought it was earlier than that for some reason. I thought it was 2017. Could very so well. Copyright's 2017. Now, obviously, he could have been talking about it two years after that fact. But I took that to mean that um, when he was writing it, he was not, um, he would not have been aware of what was going to transpire um, in, you know, with the, with the previous administration as You're we right. speak. So, right. so I was kind of, it was, I thought it was interesting uh, that either he was a harbinger or he had suspected that something crazy might happen, but, um, but that, yeah, that blows so, my theory out of the water. If, uh, if that's, if that's the copyright date, then, then yeah, he would have to be writing before the 2016 election and uh, felt something was in the water. Yeah. I mean, well, certainly we could have like suspected that something, you know, was going to happen, but uh, yeah. I don't know that anybody could predict exactly what was going to happen. No, but but to stick with the history for a little bit, I mean, these are two figures that I've read. You know, I've read Churchill. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first moved to the area that I live in now, there's a uh, library in walking distance, a small library, but um, is it a Carnegie was, Library? No, um, but uh, later it became associated with that system. Um, it's a memorial library that was uh, built. Uh, it's it's housed. It's in a uh, they call it a mansion. It's a three it's a three story structure. It's nothing that elaborate, but uh, I mean it's it's nice. It's old. It's got big tall windows. Um, if it were a house, it'd be pretty luxuriant. Uh, you know, luxurious at the time uh, when people lived in there. But um, but it's nothing like the Carnegie. Yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> But the, before they were affiliated with the Carnegie Library system, and you could order things online and you could get things sent there. This is, you know, like the early 90s. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you actually had to go to the library and you could order a book at the desk, but it was real big to do. So mm -hmm. um, I just pillaged their uh, history section, which wasn't all that big, but I literally decimated it. I probably read every 10th book. And, uh, you know, because wow. just, 
Finally, I, I don't have the urge to, you know, my, my pedantic urge to, to uh, give the definition of uh, decimate. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I try to do that as I go sometimes to help people out. <laughs> but uh, well, we were just talking about Roman history a little bit before, and there'll be another Perfect. video, hopefully, when Robin comes on, we'll talk about that. But uh, yeah, so um, I did go through it, and uh, they had Churchill's uh, World War II uh, memoir. And I was like, wow, I've never read this. And I had, I was just coming off of the Civil War uh, trilogy with, uh, you know, written by Shelby Foote. So I felt like I was able to do a six volume series. Uh, but what was interesting, and this comes up in, th in this book, um, mm -hmm. Rick's book, uh, which is, you know, I got a little bogged down after the second volume. And I, and at the time, I couldn't quite figure out why. I thought, well, this is the good part. You know, we're in the midst of the war. And now I get to see what Churchill's thinking and the grand strategy and, you know, and all this stuff. And it wasn't quite as uplifting, eloquent. It, was, it wasn't what I expected. Now it you know as why. Good as what had come forward. Now I know because Thomas says that, you know, he had a lot of help. And he kind of lost steam after the second book. And he, in, the fir, in the first two volumes, he was referring to notes that he had taken uh, you know, during the war, I guess. And then at some point, he must have gotten so busy that he was unable to do that. I, that's what I figure. I mean, at some point, he didn't do it. But I was just figuring, like, well, oh, events of the day. I mean, for crying out loud, it's 1941. The lights are going out all over Europe. And you're going to, like, you know think about 1946 i don't think so you know what i mean like it would have been enough to think about the next day but um yeah so it was interesting to see that he said that he had a whole committee of people helping him write it but that the last four volumes were pretty much written by somebody else right right with uh, loosely based on on, on uh, his notes but uh, possibly with not a lot of input from him um, um and he so churchill in this book I found, I, I really didn't know that much about him uh, before reading the book, uh, probably the cursory knowledge that many Americans have, um, which is very cursory. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he explores uh, his, uh, well, let, let me back up a little bit. Uh, what I learned was that Her Churchill was actually uh, what we would now call, uh, he had a desire to be an influencer um, as a young man. He, uh, I suppose, back in the day, they would have said wanted to make a name for himself. You know, he had to go, go had to go do something to make a name for yourself, have an adventure, uh, something ex perhaps exotic, out of the ordinary that you could hold up in front of other pe people and say, "Look at me! Look at this thing I did! Doesn't this make me unique?" So it's it's uh, it's almost uh, social media like in that regard that he uh, decides to go. Uh, help me out here. Which country was it? Do you recall? He he was he was in country South with, Africa, South Africa with the British Army for for really a very short period of time, six months I think total is is his entire military service something like that. And yeah, I think it was a t I think he went as a rep well he joined the cavalry. We know that his father was disappointed by that actually. Well, his father was deeply disappointed in, in him, uh, apparently throughout most of his life and uh, was, uh, wow, I, I, you, can't, you can't imagine that Churchill wasn't deeply influenced by the type of father he had, yeah. because to have a father express in uh, such excoriating terms, what a deep disappointment he's been to him, um, that that had to play a, a big psychological factor in, in who Churchill was to eventually become. Yeah. In fact, Rick says that he said, there's two things that could have happened. He, in Rick's estimation, you know, one, he could have cowered, cowered up and, you know, curled mm -hmm. up into a ball of, mm -hmm. of self, uh, you know, pity, pity and, and hatred and, and whatever yeah. self, whatever other negative thing you want to put after the self hyphen, but, um, but instead, or he could have risen to the occasion and broken mm -hmm. out of that, his mm -hmm. father's uh, model, and uh, that's what he ended up doing. But I guess when he wrote that letter that's that that we we both read, he you know uh, Churchill's father uh, writes this just crushing letter, you know, saying like basically I I you know you're just going to amount to nothing. You're just going to be one of those wastrels who's mm -hmm. going to go through life and not not do anything important and uh, 
and don't even bother to answer this part of the letter. And, and I will not accept or consider anything else that you say about your so-called accomplishments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Now um, mm -hmm. there is a little bit of a, uh, you know, explanation in the in this book that he's on his deathbed, you know, he's in pain when he's writing this. But still, I mean, even under the influence of medication or, or in great pain, you know, do you really reach out to your, your son and, and just berate him like that, you know? No, so you, you might imagine that he might be driven to extremes, but you have to start off from, you already have to be starting uh, from a point where you have ill will towards your son who you, you feel is disappointment. Sure. Let's say medication dialed it up to 11, but clearly there was, there was already, you know, deep resentment and disappointment there. Here's and the and so I'm trying to, yeah, go ahead. Well, I don't know if he's writing the letter or if he's dictating the letter, if he's dictating the letter, then I give him a little more leeway. If he's writing the letter, Oh my gosh, when you're writing a letter, you have time to consider to your words and the impact of those words. So you know, come on, but I, I don't know. We don't know. I don't know what the case is. It's not clear in the book. So. Well, and he was dying from syphilis. So we should, we should mention that as well. That's true because that uh, can uh, make you mad. Yeah. Right. 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 But still the, the, uh, the effect uh, had to have been a lifelong one um, for, for men to, uh, to feel they have so disappointed their fathers calling Dr. Freud. There's a lot to be said there. And uh, surely it's a, it's a key factor in who you become and what you choose to do with your life. And his mom. Uh, yes. Know, she's, his, she's a playgirl, basically. She just, she apparently had multiple lovers. His American um, mother. Had, yeah, that's right. And had uh, a tattoo, which ladies of society did not have tattoos at that time. Oh. Only ladies of the night had tattoos of that, you know, variety. And yet, you know, mm -hmm. she was well noted for having a an active social life is the way, <laughs> it, which I, I absolutely adore that phrase, you know, because yeah. now now who cares? Right. But no. they're coming off of Victorian England. You know, I mean, like this is the late 1800s, early 1900s, like, right. you know, the, the we're, you know, free love didn't exist yet. You know, that was that didn't come around until the 20s, basically, or. You know, and really until the 60s, but like there was a kind of a free love movement in the 20s. But um, yeah, so like, but, you know, she was she had a um, I, I like the one quote she said as she was getting older, I guess, into what she considered older in her 40s. She <laughs> said, I shall never get over the fact that I am not the most beautiful woman in the room. <laughs> Uh, well, um, so to, to touch on that for a moment, I, I read a book a few years ago, which was very out of, uh, out of character for me, but uh, the review that I read uh, just made it sound so interesting. It was, a, it was a, a book about Ava Gardner, who was married to Frank Sinatra, famous movie actress she was, uh, one of the most beautiful women in Hollywood. And uh, it was largely the story of, it's a, it was a meta story. It was a story about an aborted attempt for her to uh, write an autobiography um, with the help of a writer um, because this was in the 1980s. She needed the money. Uh, you know, she and Sinatra parted ways in I think the early 60s. Um, and she, she needed to be kept in the style to which she was accustomed to. Um, and the, the, the big thing I remember about that book was that her beauty was so uh, uh, inimical to who she was, such, such a part of her, that when you lose that, she would say time and again uh, during those 1980s interview sessions for this book that never came to be, uh, how crushing it was for her that she had lost this supernatural ability to cloud men's minds, basically. It's, <laughs> it, it is a superpower that you're, you're gorgeous, you radiate, uh, heads turn, Forks drop in the restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, and for for possibly men, but it, it affects women much more because it's harder to grow old gracefully, as men are accused of doing. Um, that to lose that power is is very difficult. So long way to say that. I think I understand to a certain extent where uh, where Winston Churchill's mother was probably coming from when she wrote that. Addendum to that little short story. Um, she never wrote the autobiography because it was going to contain all the juicy bits that would make it highly saleable. Frank Sinatra found out he would be deeply embarrassed by everything that was in there. 
he gave he gave her more money than she would have received to have the book published and she was financially saved it's fair it's a fair <laughs> deal you know plus he's he still loved her yeah i mean well, of course i mean see that's the thing i could well we can go on about that but like you know at some point you loved something about the person if you married you know so you know, even if things go sour, but we don't have to get into all this kind of stuff. No, we can go back to uh, Churchill, which, you know, now that we covered his parents' background, um, one of the things that I found interesting because he becomes such a man of letters. But uh, early on, there's this uh, quote that I'd never heard. Uh, and he said, uh, it's important for a young man not to read too many good books and to pollute. Well, he doesn't say pollute. How does he say it? He says, I think I actually wrote it down. Don't tax the brain while you're young by reading too many good books. Chew your food like an old man. <laughs> well, I, I wonder if he took his own advice there. Um, because, and I don't, I forget that it's been a couple of weeks since I finished the book. Uh, so yeah, some, the, some details were already eluding me. Right. But um, one of the things I learned was that uh, he was no academic superstar uh, at no. all. He was, uh, he was quite average. Um, and also he was, um, he was kind of a charity case for the, the public school he was in. And remember when you're in England, public school means private school, private school means public school, very confusing. Um, and this school was, uh, was bound to take uh, a certain number of students who were, who were not overachievers. Um, that was another reason for his uh, for his father's uh, disappointment in him. So he, you expect again with that cursory level of uh, knowledge that most Americans have, you think Churchill. He must be Type A driven, uh, uh, and usually people like that who ascend in the way that he did are that way, probably innately from birth. Not him. He didn't. He didn't have that kind of a story. He, he no, didn't, in he fact, they didn't catch fire until later. Well, he's a bully too. They say, you know, mm -hmm. like um, at one point, a kid stabs him with a pen in the chest, and his mother says, "Well, he, I'm sure he deserved it. Probably tormented the heck out of that kid for him to do that." You know, so his, his parents were not like, "Oh my gosh, our little good little boy." Not cool. no, they knew Billy would son. never do that. Yeah, they knew their son, right? Exactly. But uh, yeah, so. Um, I don't know. How, do we want to keep going with Churchill? Or we want to flip to George. Orwell? So I don't. I don't know that there's that much in Orwell's uh, uh, formative years that is really that notable. Um, right. I think, I think Churchill's history is a little more interesting because he's born of of um, um, parents of higher standing, shall we say? Yeah. Um, Orwell's not. Right. And one of the things I really learned in this book, uh, I learned much more about the English class system than I knew before. Um, and that, that's a, that plays a big part in it does explaining the background of the two of them and some of their motivations and the way they see the world. Well, it does. I mean, Orwell's father, right? Orwell grows up in India, right? That's right. And his father's what, like a, not a policeman. He's like a, I don't know what he is exactly. He's like a civil servant, but he has some kind of authority, mm -hmm. power mm -hmm. of authority. I don't know that he's actually a policeman. I think it says at one point, I think one of the chapter headings is Orwell, the policeman. Orwell ends up doing something like that very briefly. Well, actually not briefly, four years, I think, um, which is, seems really out of character for what we know about Orwell and authority after that. Right. But during that process, there was one incident uh, when they talk about Orwell's experience, um, not as a really young man, but as a young adult in, in that line of work apparently he was part of a detail to take a man to the gallows to be executed. And he noted that the man, as they're walking to, to the, the, um, the scaffold or wherever they were going to do the deed, uh, I'm not sure the method of um, execution, he, um, the man steps out of the way, the condemned man steps out of the way of a mud puddle. Like, yeah. And yeah. at that point, Orwell has this great revelation, like, mm -hmm. this man is alive. He's mm -hmm. vital. He's still reacting to life, you know, like we would. We would step out of the way of the mud puddle. If you're a condemned person, you know you're going to die in a few minutes. Why? Who cares, right? But no, it, you know, and he said the waste of life, you know, just in that, 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 that whole process, you know, and that was the thing that he got out of that experience mm -hmm. was that, you know, 
this this is a this is a human being you know this is a vital human being who could could, could accomplish and do things but but we're we're going to selectively terminate his life and it, it was just it, i thought that was pretty um I thought that was pretty profound. I'm sure he was deeply impacted by it. I was it's extremely profound. I mean, it, it's, uh, uh, it's the experience that I think any of us have had if we've come across, say, a dead bird lying on the ground. And I always think of the phrase, when I see a live bird, the phrase, the spark of life. The, the barrier that separates the dead bird on the ground from the one who's hopping around grabbing berries off of the bush um, it's very thin, very narrow, and it's so easy to cross from one to the other uh, that it makes you appreciate the, the magical nature of whatever that spark of life is. And of course, we know biologically what it is, but that doesn't really capture it, does it? No, of course it doesn't. It's something, something much, more bigger, uh, much more big than that. It's, uh, it is something that's kind of magical. And I think that um, he was having that exact same realization right there that even though this criminal... Perhaps he was awful. Maybe he did hideous things. We don't know. We don't know. But, but at that particular moment, the knowledge that you are about to kill that spark, even with the most hideous criminals, you would have to be, you'd have to be missing some element of humanity not to really consider it hard. Well, there's two moments in each of their early uh, military careers that, that go on. So we, I guess we should go back to Churchill and talk about South Africa. What would end up being the Boer War? He was there and he was, you know, he went into the cavalry. I, I, I was saying before, I guess he went to the cavalry, but that was not a prestigious assignment. Mm -hmm. See, I would right. have thought the cavalry would have been like the cavalry, you know, the infantry right. is like everybody, but the cavalry, no, the cavalry was where rich kids went because they could afford the horses. <laughs> Right, right. Then, they knew how to know, ride. Yeah, but yeah. but Winston liked it because he liked the uniform. Mm -hmm. Like his, so he has elements of his mother in there where he likes the you know the dress and Play. he talks about gold and he talks about all these wonderful colors and how he uh, he um, he feels sorry for brown. You know. Well, you know the interesting thing about that is um, that's something that would carry on uh, throughout his life. Uh, rarely, as prime minister during the war years, did he miss an opportunity to wear military dress. Uh, think of how many how, think of how many times he appeared with uh, with Roosevelt in their meetings for, uh, on public display, and he would be wearing. Uh, I'm not sure what the what the alignment is. I mean, he was, of course, the former. Uh, a vice lord of the admiralty, the, the lord the, of the admiralty, the lord of the admiralty, yeah, the equivalent, the yeah. equivalent of our secretary, secretary of the navy, right? Um, and there's something about uh, the British system that allows you to continue to wear uh, the military outfit, of course, in the United States with the hard line separation between civilian and military that would never occur. Um, but he was clearly into regalia, yeah, yeah. which I think most, I most British aristocrats are. That's it's kind of their thing. <laughs> it's part of the yeah. I mean, it's part of the, the badge of office. You know, it's part of the mm -hmm. dress. And like you said, like a young mil a young man who is going to embark on any kind of political career um, would would have to have a military a mil well would not I, I won't say it would have to, but a military background where one achieved something in a military fashion would do wonders for for an entree into the political arena let's put it well and that that used to be a, a near requirement in the american system if you wanted to be president you had to have had military experience in order for people to trust you as commander-in-chief and of course that was broken by clinton it and, was definitely, and has, has never been replaced since then it was definitely true um in ancient rome i can tell you that like you had to be basically, mm -hmm. you know, in order to reach the higher levels of office, unless mm -hmm. there was something physically wrong with you that, that did not allow you to do that. If you mm -hmm. had an infirmity of some kind, but otherwise, yeah, you did military service. Um, the, uh, the incidents though, that, that, that I wanted to talk about with Churchill. So he, so he's in a, Right. He's, he's writing for a newspaper, basically something like Stars and Stars and Stripes, I guess, mm -hmm. American World War II military. Um, and he's attached to um, a regiment. I forget the size of the I, I may be using the wrong words, you know, platoon regiment squad. I, I, I don't know in this particular case, but um, they're there's they're there's they're taking a railroad, apparently a rail line. 
and they're walking along this rail line. They're taking it from the Dutch settlers, the Boers. And um, as they're doing that, um, they come under fire and enemy forces. And uh, Churchill ends up organizing a, uh, a, an organized retreat. They're over, they're over, you know, there's too many of the enemy forces. So he helps to organize the retreat and subsequently is captured. But he says something about being shot at which mm-hmm. I thought was really fascinating. Do you mm-hmm. remember that? Yes, I, I remember reading it, uh, but I couldn't do the quotation. I'm hoping that you have it in front of you because it's, uh, it's pretty good. Nothing in life is so exhilarating as to be shot at without result. Yes. <laughs> it's always great when they don't hit you, I, I imagine. It's a, <laughs> I mean, it's bravado. There's no doubt. In fact, Ricks, who apparently uh, is, was a reporter during um, the invasion, the second, I think it was the second Iraq war. Second yes, that's, that's Amer- right. American, uh, the U.S. Iraq war. Yes. Um, he was attached, you know, similar to what Churchill was, I guess. Mm-hmm. He's, mm-hmm. he's making a comparison and mm-hmm. he's saying, yeah, well, the problem with being under fire is you don't know when it's going to stop, mm-hmm. you know, and you don't know where it's coming from a lot of times and all this mm-hmm. sort of thing. So he said, there's probably some bravado in there. And, and I'm sure there is, but of course. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, Orwell, unfortunately, has the opposite thing happen to him. He yes. gets under fire and he gets shot in the throat. <laughs> right. So we, we should step back a little bit and talk yes. about how he how he actually arrived in that uh, position. Right. Um, and this speaks to he's a young man who's who's deeply earnest. So we're talking about the, the 1930s when the world has turned upside down for Western democracies because uh, it's a global depression. Uh, democracy is in not just the United States, but in Europe, uh, there are deep questions as to whether it functions because it seems to have failed. Uh, democracy does not seem to be capable of dealing with the depression, ending it uh, and finding a way out of it. And there are competing ideologies like communism and fascism which seem to offer a way out. And of course, communism now is, is, uh, is uh, we think about Stalin, we think of the purges, we think of the gulags, we think of uh, the deaths of millions at the hands of the state. But this is at a time before any of that was known and before any of it had happened. Right. So from that perspective, um, to people of the 30s, um, communism seemed like it might not be a bad deal, and uh, it's got to be better than what we're going through right now because I'm tired of standing in line at the soup kitchen. So um, Orwell is um, having the same evaluation. Um, he's, he's hard left. Um, and interestingly, he's not what we would have today. You have a Twitter warrior where you sit at home and espouse your political opinions all day. He actually does something. He, he packs his suitcase and he joins the uh, the leftist movement in in Franco's uh, against Franco in Spain with his wife. Is, with his wife, which his is wife really, comes along like his which wife is insane. Comes insane. Too. So, it's so put your money where your mouth is. Well, there's a couple things going on here, I think. So, um, uh, I mean, there's a lot I want to say about that. Um, the grand political movements. Mm. Maybe I can go back to that, but but. But what I'm thinking of right now is that women's suffrage in the United States only happened Mm -hmm. in the last decade or so, Mm -hmm. right? Prior to this. So we're talking about women getting the right to vote in what, 1920? 2024. 24, I think, was the first election, but I think it was a passed in 20. Mm -hmm. So the first national, the first presidential election was 24. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, uh, the communist system um, very loudly... um, said that women have equal rights to men. Right. Uh, that was a big appeal for a lot of women in the West, you know, that mm. uh, their, their political voice would be heard. Um, so I could see that. Now, we don't know a ton about her in this book, mm. but, um, but you know, you could see where, where, you know, she was young and vital and, and she was willing to go fight as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so, so something happens, though, when, when Orwell gets there, there's, he, he's like many people, Hemingway included, and he's talked about in here, um, they, you know, people from other countries joined what was called the International Brigade. Mm-hmm. But he was dissuaded 
by a friend who was already in Spain from doing that. And, and he, his friend said, no, don't go to the international brigades. Those guys are jerks. I know the captain over there. I know the, you know, one of the officers, you don't want to go there. Come with me. Um, you know, we're fighting. We're actually fighting. You know, we're actually going to the front lines. We're not talking about it. We're just, we're, go, we're going, you're going to see some action. And, and, and Orwell wanted to see combat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's what I've led to believe in this book anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it he, sounds that way to me as well. So he joins this, this, um, this, you know, unbeknownst to him that this was going to have political consequences. He joins a brigade and it's a communist brigade. Right. But unfortunately for him, it's the POUM, which I can't remember the Spanish uh, words that 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 stands for. But it turns out to be a, a very un what ends up being an unpopular sect of the communist contingent. Yeah. And uh, because we're, not the people's front of Judea. we're the people's uh, Judean front. It's 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 considered the Trotskyite. Right. At a right. point when yes. when Stalin doesn't want Trotsky to have any influence anywhere. So, right. yeah. So the, that so Russian Soviet backed communists are quietly disposing of the members of uh, of Orwell's group at this point. That's right. In fact, he gets hurt when he gets hurt. At the front line, gets shot through the throat. And it's, what's interesting, I think, is the reaction. So, like, Churchill doesn't get shot the first time he's in combat. And he has this bravado quote, right? Mm -hmm. And then Orwell gets shot in the throat. And he, re and he, sa and he describes it. Mm -hmm. He describes, like, what it's like. He's like, I, I knew I was wounded, but I didn't really know where. Mm -hmm. And then as I'm laying there and somebody's telling me it was my throat, I thought, well, that's it. Because I, ne I never heard of anybody like recovering from a wound in the throat before. Well, it was I the mean, neck. It was, it was some, it, he, the word he repeated was neck. That, neck. You, know, you, you don't yeah, survive a, you don't survive a shot in the neck. Yeah. And so he said, I got a couple minutes here. Yeah. He, he was you certain know? he was going to die. Yeah. He's like, you know, say goodbye to my wife for me and that. And then he ends up living. And, uh, but, uh, uh, but unlike Churchill, yeah. um, because he was not self-promotional, he didn't turn that into a moment of glory. It wasn't, well, it wasn't something that he uh, seemed to bask in. Well, yeah. And, and if I remember correctly, it wasn't like he was charging into battle when it happened. No, it was just, not at all. It came from it just nowhere. Happened. It, it just was, happened. He was, he was doing something. He was getting up. He was, he was trying to say something to, he was like a squad leader. He was like a corporal or something, I guess, like a, a lower non-commissioned officer, I guess you'd call it. And, uh, and he was saying something to his troops and he was dumb enough to get up uh, onto a, like a parapet or, or something, a rise where he was silhouetted. And he knew and, and he, was, uh, he was six foot two, I believe. He's quite tall. Exactly. Yeah. And so the sniper is just like, poof, right. Easy target, sitting duck, you know. Well, one of the things he wrote, he did write about, which apparently, I, I guess, if you read military history, which I haven't read a lot of, is that. Uh, these situations are just filled with long stretches of boredom where yeah. nothing, nothing's happening. It's not, it's not uh, endless excitement uh, or alarm. Uh, most of the time you're, you're doing nothing. You're, uh, you're reading newspapers, uh, you're cleaning up, you're trying to find ways to, to keep yourself occupied. You're dying of disease. <laughs> yeah. you know, dying I of mean, it's so many, I mean, you know, combat casualties are not until recently in recent history, but like in most of uh, warfare, you know, people died of illness more, mm -hmm. much more, many fold more than they died of combat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, but while he's laid up, like you said, the commissars are out there like rounding up people and disappearing people. And yeah. And a friend, a friend told him uh, uh, yeah. that he was on the list and they were looking for him. Yeah. It's time to get out. Time it's to get out. out. And it's all cloak and dagger. Like, you know, the, the, it's house to house and he has to sleep in a, you know, one place one night and another place the other night till they're waiting for a way to get out. And, mm -hmm. you know, he and so it was wife. a harrowing escape. But the, yeah. the most important part of this portion of his life is it's extremely formative in the way he views the world, because what he what he sees is so anybody who's uh, you and I have talked about this, anybody who has direct experience of an event and then sees it covered in the press. Yeah, is invariably uh, disappointed. Well, oh if, my god if, if you have if you have real faith in free media uh we have we have faith in free media but 
when we have uh, direct experience with the thing being covered, we are usually disappointed in the way that it is covered. So sure. what he what he found was that um, his side, the leftists, were lying about what was going on in the war just as much as the other side was, and this was kind of shattering to him. He he really thought, well, I'm, we're the good guys. We don't do that. And he finds out, yeah, everybody does it. Both sides do it a lot. So here's the quote. Um, I don't know that it's exactly about this particular uh, period of time in the Spanish Civil War, if it's about World War II later, but he says, it applies to both. He says, one of the dreariest effects of this war has been to teach me that the left-wing press is every bit as spurious and dishonest as that of the right, which is basically right. what you just said. And it's just, it's just, you know, it's got to be so deflating to him, especially as a writer and someone who wrote for the left press, you know, and somebody who, who, if you're going to drop all your stuff and, and go off to, to Spain, you're clearly an idealistic. Sure. Person. So this is, this is doubly uh, cutting that not only is this civil war, not what you thought it was going to be, uh, but you're learning some hard truths about things that you thought you understood. Yeah. I mean, so he becomes completely disillusioned now with, you know, Stalinist communism. I mean, he knows now, you know, mm -hmm. we're fighting fascists on our front and we're fighting the, you know, mm -hmm. the our so-called allies in the rear. So like you can't win. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it, it, it that, you know, you think like, you know, you see, you know, it's so funny because I was I interviewed a, a, a lady, Tiffany, and we were talking. She was talking about how she wants to write this book. She wants to write a book about um, talking animals. And she's like, do you think that would work? And I'm like. Uh, animal farm and what was so funny is that not two days later a little library in my neighborhood i found this book which is... oh you you found that you found a hardback in the little library that's yeah, fantastic i know can you believe it so 1984 and, and, and animal farm so this points out that that uh the subtitle uh for animal farm is a fairy tale right right but apparently there's a long tradition of that you know i mean I didn't think of it until Rick's point points it out, but there's, you know, um, Peter rabbit. Mm -hmm. There's um, of course, um, uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there's many more apparently that I was, I had been unaware of. I recognize some of the titles. I didn't read a lot of English talking animal books that were written around 1900, but uh, <laughs> apparently there's a long neither. tradition okay. of this. So, but, but not to jump ahead, but, but we can understand where this, 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 because one of the things about reading Orwell, and I've read both Animal Farm in 1984, not recently mm -hmm. as a younger person, mm -hmm. but even as a younger person, I was uh, depressed by the, by his, his just cynicism, you know, and, and now, but now I know where it came from, you know, because it's real because, yeah. uh, and interestingly um american students your first exposure to animal farm is in high school typically that's that's where i uh was first exposed to it and it's a young age uh actually even even in teen years to be exposed to animal farm because right. it is cynical because what 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 your teachers are telling you it, through this work is that everything you've been told is a kid you know happily ever after do the right thing and everything will be okay uh follow the rules and everything will be okay um there are institutions that are trustworthy you should respect them you you become older and they're trying to give you the first entry to a lot of that is not true and this is a way to stick your toe in the water through an allegory you haven't got all the history yet you don't know where this book came from or what motivated him to write it right but the themes are there these are things that you're actually going to counter in the real world if if you're a thinking person uh, that you're going to, you're going to encounter duplicity, but also a lot of grayness, moral grayness. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, Animal Farm is, is uh, not morally ambiguous at all. Neither is 1984. They're very black and white and very clear, yeah. but they have their origins in moral ambiguity. They, they, as Animal Farm does, it all starts off with the best of intentions and you feel for the animals, like the farmer, man, he's, he, they're getting a raw deal from the farmer, man. We got to stand up for, we got to unionize. We got to stand up for our rights. And it's all coming from a good place, honest intentions. And then we see where it goes when power corrupts, as it always does. Sure. Yeah. When a movement gets radicalized, right? 
when a movement gets radicalized, yes, when things are out of control, when there's no counterbalance, and the pigs never had a counterbalance. Well, what you sent to me today about uh, the description of Star Wars, you know, when the <laughs> farm boy oh, yeah. you know, gets, taught, gets taught an ancient religion, radicalized uh, after a military attack on his family. <laughs> and then, then he goes off and he kills 300,000 people. <laughs> I mean, that is one way to look at the story, right? That is, that happens. Those stormtroopers had families, man. They, they may, they did actually, they weren't clones at that point. Who, who's going to pay, who's going to pay their family back home? Oh man. That's, you know, this is how blood feuds get started. But his We will smash the like button on the seas and oceans. We will smash the like button in the fields and the hills. We will subscribe to the channel. We shall never surrender. Uh, uh, Ricks is a harsh critic when it comes to a lot of Orwell's uh, attempts at uh, being a novelist. Oh, well, I'm sure his early works weren't stellar just like most writers early works aren't well my, my ears perked up because um i was not familiar with uh what ode to catalonia and some others um but uh probably 15 years ago on the strength of nothing more that than he wrote it i i picked up coming up for air um which ricks repeatedly bashes that book it's un, unreadable he calls it i finished it um it's not memorable um, but I finished it. it. It didn't leave me with anything. There was no, there was no great takeaway. Yeah. Um, but uh, clearly it was all building a, as a novelist. Um, he needed to have something that he was deeply invested in. And that's why 1984 is, is, uh, is his masterwork. But he and writes also, that right he's a before. better essayist. He's a much, yeah. much better essayist. But he writes 1984 almost like a year or two before he dies. Right. So that's like right. He doesn't die. He doesn't die as an old man either. He dies pretty young, right? Doesn't he die in his forties? Forty-six, I believe. Quite Jeez. young. That's quite young. Not, even at the time. That's very young. Uh, but he had been in Ill, he had been in ill health for a good part of his adult life. Oh, uh, suffering from TB. The and all yeah the the TB and the wound. He always had a raspy voice. They said he always had trouble breathing and that sort of thing. Coughed a lot. Um, so he here's something that I was interested in. So. I know that he doesn't come from the, the royal, you know, the, the, the noble surroundings that Churchill does. Not an aristocrat. But it's kind of implied that when he goes on his adventure that he eventually writes about in Down and Out in Paris and London. Is that what it's called? Uh, London and Paris. Something like that. But yeah, I know, what you, I know what you mean. And he tells this wonderful story about the restaurant, which I want to get to. But it, it sounds like it's not necessary, right? Like that he is, he doesn't have to live with the squalor he doesn't have to live in the tenements he doesn't have to live in the with the with the uh the beggars it, it sounds the, like he has a way out yeah it yeah, does it's, it's like it's but, not uh, he has options but then later in his life it talks about how he starts to have some success later financially and he's able to start paying back an anonymous benefactor who had given him some money at some point like 10 years before that yeah so which is it? I don't understand. Is he a struggling writer? I mean, and obviously there's a length of time. There is 20 some years. He could have ebbs and flows in his income, but and I, think I, I was slightly a, confused by that. I think because uh, this book is uh, fairly brief. I mean, it's 300 plus pages. Um, it's not an autobiography of either of the men. It's really, uh, you That's get just prepared. enough. You, you get just enough uh, a background in their personal life to get, to get insight into um, how they became the persons that they were and why they saw the world in the way that they did and why they took the actions that they did. Right. Um, I mean, we could talk for a minute about what, what's the genesis of, of the book at all. Well, that's why, a really great, I mean, what's the thread here, right? I mean, obviously, the, what joins, what joins these two men? The enough? fight for freedom seems to have a, uh, an indicator, that seems to be an indicator, you know? It, it is an indicator. Um, I, I still think they're an odd pairing. Me too. Um, they're, one's a politician, the other one isn't. If you wanted to have a kind of a balancing effect of this or that, 
you would pit uh, Churchill's uh, liberal opponent in, in uh, His Majesty's government. Uh, but no, he doesn't do that. He picks somebody from a completely different sphere and domain of public life. Yeah. Um, how often do you ever compare and contrast a national leader with an author, particularly an mm -hmm. author who wasn't even notable when he was alive? No, Rick not strikes very, home the point. The yeah. Rick strikes home the point again and again that Orwell was was uh, really kind of nobody when he was alive. He was a very minor author. Yeah. And it's only been posthumously that his reputation has grown and grown and grown yeah. uh, all through 1984. That's true. That's very true. So, uh, so the, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, before we gloss over the, the restaurant scene, I, yes. you know, it's, it's kind of a precursor of Bourdain almost to say the back of the house, the kitchen con confidential kind of thing. And I worked uh, in restaurants uh, as most, you know, that was my career for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought it was very interesting to see the contrast when he has, you're talking about class, but this is in Paris. And he's talking about, you know, the white linen, the beautiful dining room, and then the squalor right behind the door, you know? And if you had any idea that the dishes were being washed three floors down in this dank dungeon of a, you know, with a barely any light and who knows what's scurrying around on the floor, would you really be eating in this, in this, you know, in this establishment? But uh, it just, it's just, it's so funny because, um that exists you know oh that, yeah and that exists to this day it exists it you know of course you it have... does. some of the fanciest meals are prepared by uh people who are living on the margins of society sure and uh and people that you know the person that's eating the food would probably be loath to associate with you know Absolutely. outside of any kind of framework that would be outside that restaurant. Restaurants um, are an illusion. I mean, it's a, it's, a, yeah. it's, it's a magic show. You're kind of paying to be fooled in a way. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Definitely. But I, I, the thing I wanted to say about the, the restaurant is that uh, I think two things are going on there. Um, one, he, he identifies with the working class. Yes. That's where, that's where his sympathies lie. Um, even if he's not, uh, completely part of them because as you as you say it seems as though he has he has ways to to be above that um, and the second thing is is that it may have also just been a convenient topic because he's a young writer he's looking for things to write about and apparently he enjoys social commentary so this is kind of a natural thing to write about it's a good point it's a really good point but I think what makes what's interesting is that Rick establishes that he is a champion of the lower classes. Yeah. Even though he hates the way they smell. Apparently. So he, yes. And, and apparently and Orwell has, is cursed as I am with this incredible sense of smell. Ah, you have this as well. Unfortunately. How have I known you for this amount of time and never, never heard about this? Well, we've not been in the same city for a long time. So we haven't had those <laughs> kinds of sensory, shared sensory experiences. Yeah. You know? But so there's now, a word for it. And I do you know do you know what the word for it is? Oh no, I'm not saying I have a medical condition that 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 I'm just saying that I I I can I don't think. Well, we don't know, we don't know if Orwell had, you know, a clinically diagnosable condition, but yeah. he he either had a hyper sense of smell or he was obsessed with smell, one or the other. Either could be true. Well, but, as a writer, it's very challenging to try to describe smell. It's really challenging. And and right. Taste is really challenging, but what, like five, five words for taste in the English language. I thought there were four, but maybe there are five now. No, yeah. I think you're right. I think it is just four. But I thought also smell is also the same. So yes. smell was acrid, pungent, redolent, redolent, yeah. uh, pungent. Yeah. And, and I always forget the fourth one, yeah. Um, yeah. but I'll, I'll remember it in three o'clock in the morning tonight. So, uh, you know. <laughs> Add it below, please. Put it in the comments for us, guys and Thank gals. You. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's um, it's you know, it 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 you know everything. It's a, tick it, that he it's has. a simile. Everything else is a comparison. So it's like right. smell like daisies, smell like roses. You know. So. But that's an interesting thing about language is that and this is this is a tangent. Uh, when sure. you think about when you think about the dictionary. You really cannot describe any word without um, using the framework of a bunch of other things that sure. hopefully the reader is familiar with. So it's it's a ladder. There's yeah. there's no way to. It would be like trying to describe 
a color to a blind person. Exactly. How, how can you really describe a taste if you've never tasted anything? It's impossible. You must liken it to something else that tastes similar. Well, that's what I find so fascinating about, this is a total tangent. Uh, again, Ken Nordine's uh, Colors was <laughs> that he puts music and lyric poetry um, a sense of what vermilion was or what, yeah. uh, you know, uh, aqua was, you know, or olive, you know, and I, I just thought it was fascinating as an attempt, you know, who knows if he succeeds or not, I'd have to ask somebody who, uh, who um, has that, what's the, the name Synesthesia. of that? Synesthesia. Synesthesia. Yes. Yes. The, uh, you're, if you're autistic, some people like have a, they, they hear noises and they see colors. Yeah. Um, I know uh, uh, a woman that I used to work with uh, this. I don't know how this conversation came up. She was a synesthete and uh, uh, told me about how words and numbers have colors associated with them in her mind. Yeah. And it was through that conversation that I realized that I have a form of synesthesia as well. It was something that was just so, it's not something I would even talk about. I mean, it, it didn't seem, it's just, I can't even describe it in words. It's just part of how you think. So in my case, uh, I've always seen, if I, would, if I were to count one, two, three, four, in my mind, I would see the, the numbers on a, on a line uh, curving through three-dimensional space. And that curve has been exactly the same through my entire life. And if oh, I go, cool. if I go back beyond zero, it, I can see where that curve leads. So, you know, if I were to describe it to you, you know, zero would be here and then one, two, three, four, five, and then it would curve and then you go up to 10 and then you would get up to the teens and it would go like this. And then it would turn again at 20, dip down, go up towards 30 mm. and then kind of do that. Now so you studied, that, that's makes no sense. You studied a few, or you're aware of those numbers in uh, several foreign languages. Does that occur to you when you're counting in French or German? Yes, uh, yes, it does. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's what, what would be interesting to know is, does that happen? Would it happen if I were fluent? And I, I've never been, I was never fluent in French enough to the point where I wasn't mapping right. one language onto the other, right. you know, replacing one with uh, two with duh. Right. Right. Um, if it's I a word foreign, for word I, substitution, right? Yes. Yeah. If I began to dream in a foreign language, uh, would it be the same? I may never find out because I don't think that day is ever going to come. I've, I've actually dreamt in French. Um, that was funny because that's when our, um, I think we had, the, yeah, we had the same uh, professor at one point. We did. Euro. He, uh, he actually said to me once, he said, if you start dreaming in French, you know, you're nearing fluency. So that was kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, but well, that I mean, was a long, don't bother because it was a long time ago. I, uh, I don't do it anymore. I, I was just going to say that that um, what I've heard from many people is, is that uh, no matter how good your American French becomes, uh, if you go to Paris, they're, they're just going to say, please, please switch to English. You're, you're hurting my ears. So that's funny. I was at a um, wedding uh, in the United States, obviously, but uh, I was at a wedding and I was sat at the French the francophone table, you know, the francophone and, uh, table. yeah. So my friend was studying French. He was taking classes. Uh, we would practice together and, um, and he had some, uh, his teacher would, lived in France. And then there were some people who were from France and we were all at that table. It was a, it was a really nice wedding. So a really nice place, but, uh, yeah, we, um, we're sitting there. And, and so, um, some of them were speaking in French. I was speaking, I was trying to speak in French to them and blah, blah, blah. And of course, I'm using like, you know, probably fourth grade French, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. vocabulary wise. Right, but right. Uh, the one man said to me, uh, how long did you live in Paris? No. And I said, I've never been to Paris. And he said, you have a great Parisian accent. Wow. And I just said, you know, I must have had great teachers. Fantastic. There's no other way to explain that. But I just yeah. learned we learned Parisian French. We cut the ends off of words oh. um, because I later, uh, probably 10 or 12 years later, I met someone at the restaurant I worked at and he was from the south of France. He was from uh, like Bayonne area. Mm -hmm. And uh, he asked me, if we were, he was helping me practice. I said, let's speak French. You know, I can practice. It's mm -hmm. been a long time. So we were saying things and, and he said to me um, something about um, bread. Mm -hmm. But I didn't recognize pain. it because, yeah, I pronounced it pain, but he pronounced it pain. Ah. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. And he's right. like, 
And I'm like, Pat, and he's like, yeah. he's like, see you, that's Parisian. He's like, but we don't say it that way down there, you know, in yeah. the South, we say pen and we, and we, he actually says the end. I'm, so, I'm fascinated by, by accents. Uh, I always have been, too. Uh, I love that kind of stuff uh, because it, it's, uh, it's so unique and it's so defining and people love to talk about those differences. I, I, I certainly do. And Pittsburgh, of course, has a great accent. It's, it's very distinctive, very unique. Having, having grown up there, um, I was, of course, very aware of the accent. Um, but what I didn't know at the time and what I've realized in my travels since is that Pittsburgh is the extreme northern end of the southern American accent. It's, uh, it's the northernmost city of Appalachia. Yes, and it, it has that the way O's and other vowels are pronounced is extremely Southern. So you would never confuse somebody from Pittsburgh for somebody who's from you know, New, York. New Orleans or, or anywhere like that, but um, it's where it starts. And the deeper you go, the more it transforms. And also, I will tell you that that happens as you go from East to West across Pennsylvania, because the Pennsylvania accent extends into new jersey uh and then it it stops somewhere in there and transitions to more of a new york uh accent so uh accents don't respect uh state borders my uh so i have a friend brian o'neill is a local um writer and uh, newspaper reporter columnist actually he um he wrote a book and and he called it the paris of appalachia and that's what he calls interesting. Uh, interesting. That's what he calls Pittsburgh, the bridges, and you know all that sort of thing. And he says, and he's not from uh, Pittsburgh originally, although he's lived here most of his adult life. So yes. it's his adopted city. So I trust that that he's, you know, he has he has. Uh, he's, it's not a homegrown pride; it's an acquired pride. You know. Yeah. But uh, you know, there, yeah, I could talk about that all day long. But yeah, uh, Philadelphia. It certainly has that Pennsylvania accent, but it's different than Pittsburgh. Oh, completely. Wooder and daughter. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So that you know it right away. As soon as you hear that, you know, have a glass yeah. of water, you know exactly where you're from. Uh, I love people it. have people have like this, like this French speaking man from the south of France that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, people have such pride in that and will jokingly say to you, you're not pronouncing that right. <laughs> <laughs> the way I pronounce it is the way it's really pronounced. Sure. Well, yeah. I mean, well, after you travel a little bit, you realize that there is no correct pronunciation to anything. But one Absolutely. of the things I did want to, and we're way off topic, but one of the things I did want to talk about was the I finally figured out where Red Up came from. That's that's oh really? My family used that all the time. That's always been considered a Pittsburghism. Yeah, I think so. It has. Yeah. I've never heard it anywhere else. Well, I, I found it in writing. It was in Robert Louis Stevenson, the master of Ballantrae. <clears throat> yep. And he says, read up, R-E-D-D. -D yeah, U -D. it's two Ds, I know that. And uh, so it's Scottish. So so there were lots of Scots and Scots-Irish who, who were coal miners in this part of the country. And it makes sense that they would have brought their dialect with them. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're right, you know, and they're, 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 they're colloquialisms. So, absolutely. I mean, in, yeah. in uh, uh, Western Pennsylvania, uh, such a conglomeration of oh. European immigrants um, that have, uh, and of course, there's still distinctive neighborhoods that, that still exist. Um, so, yeah. To a degree, uh, it's pretty much, it's, it's more homogenized now, but yeah. yeah. Um, but, not, but up until 20 years ago, Polish Hill was still, you know, ethnic. I, I was always thinking, I was also thinking of uh, <clears throat> Brookline, mm. uh, which used to have, a, a, it was like the Italian portion of town. Well, so uh, was Bloomfield. Oh, really? Yeah. In fact, Bloomfield still, um, they um, still celebrate that. Mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. but you and I know that was a transient population. There was a lot of college kids that lived there. There were oh, low rent, um, totally. low rental apartments there. You know, absolutely and things of that nature. It were it was and geographically it was easy to get to different universities from that area. But well, and it's close into the city, and and a lot of <clears> populations. <throat> their their kids all moved out to the suburbs, and it's the story mm -hmm. of city. It's a story of cities across America. Sure, sure. 
So but, they but were way off. We got, on, we got on to this because uh, mm -hmm. George Orwell was fascinated with uh, or, or uh, obsessed with smell. Oh, right. <laughs> I forgot. We're talking about the, we're talking about the restaurant. Um, so that was those were his formative years as a writer. Uh, he, he did not have uh, economic success. And the next big chunk of his life that I recall from the book was uh, he goes to, well, I guess the war had begun and he goes to work for the BBC as, uh, as was he an essayist for the BBC? Commentator? Yeah, something like that. Something like that. He wasn't, he wasn't a well-known name. He didn't, he didn't achieve fame during his time at the BBC. He, my writer friends would say he was a hack. You know, like what he was doing was he was just writing every day, every day. Nothing like beautiful, just writing, writing you know, news stories, uh, informative, you know, about like, you know, events, you know, that kind of stuff. You know? As Huey Lewis would say, uh, he was working for a living, so he was taking what they were given. And he would know because his band was called The News. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so if you're going to be a news reporter, Huey Lewis is the guy to go to. Huey Lewis, I guess he went to Cornell, right? Is that where his band? He did he band? really? Yeah, I think he did. I don't know if they all graduated. And I think he said something. I remember my friend George, um, I interviewed George Pazin. I interviewed. Um, yeah. And he, I remember him telling me, uh, he said, admiringly, he said to me, he said, I just read that Huey Lewis said, uh, all I remember about college was playing with the band, you know? And it was <laughs> Well, if he went to Cornell, that's hard to believe. <laughs> I don't know. I well, I, we gotta. I don't know. I I think that's I, post I, research I mean, in the comments. Yeah, if I'm wrong, call me on it. I have no problem being wrong. No, I, I hope. I, that, I love I, it. Oh, I hope that's true. I because, love being wrong. Just tell me. I'm wrong. I married some. I'm married to someone who went to that university. Yeah. Uh, so oh, I, I know. And it. You got to meet Carl. Oh, I met, met Carl, Carl Sagan. Sagan. Oh. Carl Sagan. Um, just one yeah. of my idols from like you know the yeah. time I was in eighth grade. Yeah, oh. that that school is a pressure cooker, man. I if Huey Lewis went through that school and managed to play in a band and then hit the big time, uh, now I'm now I'm super impressed. So here's here's a here's a tangent for Huey Lewis. That's a band I forgot about, yeah. but in the last couple of weeks, it's like um, plate shrimp, plate of shrimp. All of a sudden, his name has been coming out of nowhere, and and I saw one of his videos recently, and I've heard a couple of his songs on Sirius XM, and I said, you know, uh, Huey Lewis and there's is kind of like a punchline and jokes about the '80s, but these guys were like hit machines. Oh one yeah, after the other, after the other. So that's some talent. You don't you don't just produce like five super big songs in a row like that. They, they had something going. It's pretty catchy, you know. See, and um, I will for that reason, I will even defend Barry Manilow because everybody he's a punchline. That guy made a ton of money because he sold a lot of records. He sold lot. he wrote songs you never even thought about. Well, he was a jingle he, writer. He did. He wrote a lot of jingles that yeah. nobody knows about. You know, he wrote like State Farm or Nationwide. Uh, he wrote like all kinds of crazy stuff, you know. But if you can um, have if you can have like 20 hit songs in a particular decade, you gotta respect that. Dude, if you if you look at the playlist the track list for sports, right? 1983. Yeah, yeah. Five of them were like top 20 songs. Right. I think five, at it, least. Was four. that his debut album? Was that a debut effort? No, it wasn't their debut album. Yeah. There was one I before that. I think it was at least their second, but I may have been their third. Um, but yeah, it was, well, put that in the comments below. But um, yeah, it's, um, you know, um, Heart and Soul. I Want a New Drug. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um don't let don't 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 tell me i'm not gonna because i can't name them okay well i used to in, be able to name first we, we right. would know all of them that was embarrassing i'm gonna cut that up so yeah, uh, that up. They're, they're good they're good songs they're, they're excellent they are top good tenors. songs yeah they all sound alike but they're good you know that was the 80s man like, that's they're, what you did here's the thing here's the thing you had a it's theme like, uh, your, your album sounded good it, it had the same sound from beginning to end you know this is this is what i say about paul mccartney he's got a lot of detractors um that he wrote a lot of silly songs after the beatles but he wrote a lot of silly songs when he was with the beatles nothing he even really wrote changed. a song called silly songs the only thing silly love songs the only thing that changed was that he wasn't co-writing with uh with lennon anymore but here's the thing you got to give him a lot of his songs were incredibly silly catchy beat hummable you remembered them you wanted to hear them again 
That's all I got to say about that. I'm with you there. I, it's hard to like, you know, I don't, I don't take sides when it comes to Lennon McCartney. I don't, I love them all. I love Harrison. I thought Ringo had some really great songs. They're real funny. They're fun. You can like, you know, they're, they're you know, I, 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 Ringo has a sense of humor. That's exactly. Like he, exactly. He's like easy going. He doesn't take yes. himself seriously. Oh, no. yeah, life fun. is fun. You know, let's have fun. I want to be under the sea in an octopus's garden in the shade. We're all in a yellow submarine. Whatever that means. What the hell's that? Uh, like? Yeah. And George has that like, you know, kind of Eastern, like hippie influence, you know, sitars and stuff. And I'm cool with all that. It's not my kind of music, but like, I'm down with it. I can listen to it. It's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, but like, yeah, I mean, McCartney, he had me because the very first James Bond movie I ever saw was Live and Let Die. Yeah. Because just what my age and when I saw the, was I was permitted to see, you know, a James Bond movie edited for TV, of course, you know, well, but than James Seymour. yeah, I mean, how could James you not James solitaire, James. man? Come on. Yeah, that, that used to be one of my Rogers favorites. stacked the deck, by the way, guys, that, that they were all the lovers. <laughs> Any yeah. cards she picked would have been the lovers. I know. Yes, I learned about that. I learned about card stacking. It, you know, it learned a lot. James Bond taught me a lot. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> much to my chagrin, probably. But um, back to the book. We will smash the like button on the seas and oceans. We will smash the like button in the fields and the hills. We will subscribe to the channel. We shall never surrender. Let's go back. Let's go no. back to Churchill. Uh, no, Churchill. Um, he's and, and Rick's kind of glosses over this. Uh, he has an early career in government where he's uh, Lord of the Admiralty. Yeah, how does he get to be Lord but of the Admiralty it, at such yeah, a young age? It just like boom, it just happens. It's not like explained. you want to be Lord of the Admiralty. Yeah, sure. Here, I'll do not it. Explained. Nobody it, wants just, to do this job. Take it. I, see, and I felt like, and I, I said before that this is a this is a slim book. And he yeah. can't go into all the details. And I, I could read another book to find out about that period in his life. But I was actually intrigued. I wanted a little, more, a little bit more detail about how did this guy who really had nothing that was uh, spectacular about him uh, suddenly become the Lord of the Admiralty well, at a young age? Okay, well, he does hint at the fact that he does have a stellar career. So apparently he does actually have a couple, par I think it's one paragraph where he says, okay, he went from South Africa back to London, to Afghanistan, back to, uh, to Sudan, to London, to India, to the Pannier, you know, past to London. I don't know. He has this, he just, he, he, he does gloss over it, but apparently he tries to establish that I'm not going to talk about all this stuff. Take it as a fact that there was a stellar young military okay. career here. Okay. He was all over the place. So, okay. yeah. so that, that, that point didn't stick with me, but clearly that must be. Yeah. True. Cause it's, cause it's this big in, in the text. It's not, he it's the only way. It's the only way to explain uh, being installed. I mean, and and this is when Britain was still an empire. Um, and how did Britain become an empire? The navy. Mm. So to be in charge of the navy is really to be like the guy who's in charge of nuclear weapons, essentially. It's the most powerful arm of the armed forces. It's a big, big hairy deal. Um, but he becomes kind of a a, a pariah in his own party. Um, he he kind of falls into irrelevance, um, particularly during the, the lead up to the portion of history where people start to become familiar with, uh, Americans become familiar with Churchill, which is lead up to the war. Um, the, uh, uh, the Tories are in charge. You have uh, Neville Chamberlain uh, as, the, as the prime minister. And here's another class issue that I learned from this book, which I thought was very interesting, which is that uh, the American service understanding is never appease an aggressor, never appease an aggressor. It's just like this reflexive thing that, that that's all you know about Neville Chamberlain. Yeah, but where did we learn that? Yeah. And he's holding the, uh, he's holding the peace accord in his hand as he's waving in the breeze, getting off of the, of the airplane after right. a, a recent successful trip with Herr Hitler. And he's got an agreement. Everything's good in Europe and there's not going to be a war. But leading up to that for years, as, as our, uh, Germany begins to rearm, uh, they begin to uh, violate the terms of the Versailles 
uh, agreement. Uh, and they start nibbling off at bits of other countries, expanding the German frontier. The uh, Tories are representing, as they do now, the, the British aristocracy. And the aristocracy had uh, their vested interest was to maintain the status quo. War will upend everything. It, it could destroy our, our very comfortable life. Uh, we wouldn't be able to take uh, our income for granted, our, our lifestyle for granted. Just give the little man what he wants, make it go away. Uh, that's what appeasement was all about. So it wasn't Neville, Cham Neville Chamberlain being a, uh, a weak, feckless leader, which, which he was in the end, but he represented the ruling class of, it, of England and their interests. He was very much in the mainstream. And in fact, the political consensus in the country was appeasement. Churchill is a complete outlier. He's off there in the corner yelling and screaming about what a what a threat this man is. The, vo this the lone voice in the wilderness. In fact, this they, can't be he allowed. called it yes. the wilderness years when he was. Yes, uh, nobody's listening to him. And in fact, he's regarded as an, as an embarrassment. Yeah. Chamberlain says, I will never have that man in my cabinet. So he, you know, he maintains a position as a, as a member of parliament, um, but he's really not near the reins of power. He's not, a, he's not uh, close to the, to 10 Downing Street. Um, and he, he's kind of, a, he's like a, a sand in the shoe, a rock in the shoe. He's an irritant for people in his party. They wish he would just shut up. So that was very interesting to me. I was um, amazed at how many pro- German um, sympath I mean, I, sympathizers, terrible word, I guess, not the right word. Uh, but how many, how many of the ruling aristocracy in England that were pro-German in the 30s? I was surprised. Well, and then of course there's Edward the Seventh, is it? Mm -hmm. One the the one who abdicated for mm -hmm. love uh, for uh, Mrs. Simpson. Mm -hmm. um, I only learned in the past couple of years that. Uh, he was, or the Germans were making overtures to him um, that, hey, look, um, you know, if you, if we overthrow the English government, we'd be happy to install you as as king, and you could you could have your queen as a, the divorcee. It would be no big deal to us, and you, you could you could be king again. He was down with that, and so was she, and they visited uh, Germany on many occasions. Um, I only recently saw the photographs of them meeting with German high officials. Wow, and. It was something that the the royals worked very hard to suppress that information. I'll bet. Yeah, because he was essentially a traitor, or would have been if he had really had the opportunity, which which he didn't get. And then, of course, England had its own uh, fascist agitator, uh, Mosley, which is only briefly touched on in, in the book. I don't know much about him. No, really. Okay. Yeah. Um, but he was he was a big voice uh, in in Britain uh, as an advocate for hey this thing that Germany is doing maybe it ain't so bad huh so so Orwell had something to say about this he had a quote that uh, Ricks pulls out it says whether the British ruling class are wicked or merely stupid mm. is one of the most difficult questions of our time. Right. And I think my response to you when you when you mentioned that quote or reminded me of that quote was uh, the classic Monty Python sketch, the uh, the twit of the year. Yeah, time. the twits. Right. Yeah. And of course, of that's that's the that's the big uh, stereotype of the uh, British aristocracy. Right. In inbred, not very bright, just have a lot of money, um, um, but really not not deserving in any way to be running society. So let's put this in perspective, okay? Before we dismiss the, the British aristocracy out of hand, I mean, obviously history <laughs> is, is, is more than wrong, but there's a, there was a logic to what they were trying to accomplish with what limited means they had. And well, not that, only that, but we're, we're, we're talking about it yeah. uh, with, with full knowledge of what was to come. Yeah, we Fair. are. We are. And I, I'm trying to place myself in 1938, 37, 39 somewhere around there before all the horrors all of the nastiness all of the things that come out later so none of this you know can be i don't want any of this to be misinterpreted but having said that you know you're england you you don't really have a standing army i mean you have a navy which is wonderful for defense right it's not really great for offense that's not the germany yeah 
You're not, not, not going to attack not Germany when, with your navy. Well, you can not, blockade yes, them. Not when modern warfare is all about aerial warfare. Right. So also, uh, your dynasty, the Hanoverian, the Hanoverian dynasty, um, has deep blood ties to um, places, geographical places, and nation states that don't exist any longer, but are now part of Germany. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, you know, you you just fought a war of you know a decade and a half before this. Uh, I, I think that's a big factor too. The I think flower that's a of your the, your generation, you're not even recovered from that. There were Correct. so many killed at the Battle of the Somme. There were Correct. so many that died in the trenches, you yep. know, of cholera yep. and other terrible illnesses. Yep. Um, you know, the, the the horror of that, the mm -hmm. poppy fields, you know, mm -hmm. the memorial services every year, these empty towns and hamlets that are still just starting to become repopulated. That is, yes. that, so you're only 15 years out. haunting you, yeah, right? You're 15, 18 years out from that point. Uh, right. So absolutely, World War I and its after, aftermath uh, loom large in how people feel about another European war. So not only that, but there are, you know, in this, you know, have you ever watched Lawrence of Arabia, right? The Sykes, um, I, I forget the other guy's name. Um, P Pico, the Sykes Pico Treaty, where they just basically they arbitrarily drew lines in the desert to make nation states of the former Ottoman Empire, right? So you've got like, oh, well, Saudi Arabia, we'll give that to Faisal, and we'll make uh, the French, you guys can have this protectorate, we'll call it Syria, and the British, you can call it Palestine, and that'll be your sphere of influence, and well, on and on and on, right? And basically, there were just guys with a map with no idea who lived there really you know who was a hashemite and who was have you, you ever know. read uh, 1918 no but i'm that sounds like a just the title i think i would love it because it, it's a uh, fascinating it, it's a it's a tome um but it was it, it got all this attention when it came out i don't know 15 years ago yeah so i i gave it a crack i did finish it um, it's tough going in some parts because it gets into the extraordinary details of how Lloyd George and, and um, uh, Woodrow Wilson and help me with the French guy, Clemenceau, uh, Clemenceau um, how, they, how they basically uh, made these decisions and how they would separate ethnic groups, right. cut them apart, right. uh, which of course uh, set up the web of of uh grievance that haunts us to this very day so you got to my point my point was that they did this in the desert they did this in eastern and central europe as well so that's right if you made if you drew an arbitrary line 15 years ago and said this is the check this is czechoslovakia now which had never existed before never that's okay right. this is the nation state that just appears on a map suddenly yep. drawn it's by the victors the rump of um of uh austria hungary right mm -hmm. and uh austria hungary loses so austria becomes a very small state you know and we'll we'll make hungary a small state and then we'll make this big state which is a conglomeration of the czechs and the slovaks and uh there are some sudeten germans in there as well uh because germany lost and you know what i mean so all these things were done with this kind of like, I mean, yes, they were done in earnest at the time, but they were also done rather arbitrarily. So for, for um, a polit an English politician who honestly, we don't want to get our hands dirty in the continental affairs that's beneath us and we don't really want to be bothered with it, but we also don't want to get sucked into a war here. So if you want us to change the border, we'll change a border, you know? Like what Correct. is it to us, right? Right, and I think I think that's, I think what you're saying is a very good point. Uh, it, it It's, it can't be just what I said earlier that that the aristocracy wants to maintain status quo. The complete picture is includes everything you just said. Uh, nobody it's in England, it's nobody wants, for sure. Nobody wants another war, um, and it's on the continent, as you as you say. And that if Germany wants to uh, to uh, have the Sudetenland, who cares? who cares? Well, that's the thing, and and it, it and at this point, um, you know. Germany is giving the other powers, they're, they're giving them a way to say, 
what they want isn't completely unreasonable, even though we know it is now. In retrospect, but, but here's, here's but the great thing about Churchill. At the time, they can tell their constituents, no, there are Germans who live there, you know, so it's oh, okay, yeah. you yeah. know, but, yeah. and by the way, you guys won't have to go fight anywhere. So that's cool too, you know. Yeah, you have all these German speaking people who are living in France. Does that seem fair? No. Yeah. And I'm not, um, you know, and, and like I said, again, disclaimer, I don't espouse any of these beliefs. I'm just trying to get in the head of what these politicians were thinking at the time. And it's important to have that disclaimer because you can't, if we're, we're trying to get into their heads, not, nothing, the horrors of World War II had not happened at that point. You're coming out of the, what is the worst war the world has ever seen, the war to end all wars, they believe at the time. We don't have, we don't want to have another one. Uh, France, Germany, England have all lost an entire generation of men as a result of it. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen. So the idea of um, placating this, this funny little man uh, to give him some extra border, Lebensraum, uh, maybe we can get away with that. Um, Churchill, on the other hand, and, and this, is, this is the big point for Ricks, is that he seems to be the only guy in the room that sees through this. He's like, no, 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 no. You can't do this because if you, if you do this, it'll have no end. You are going to destabilize the international order. All these things that you're doing, you're thinking you're shoring it up and you're ensuring peace. You're doing the exact opposite. And he's the only person that is saying this. Does Churchill know that because he was a bully? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, it just but, occurred to me, but like we talked about how he was a bully when he was younger and he knew what he got away with. And so, obviously Germany's doing this on an international scale now. Interesting theory, but here's the other thing I'll bring into your question. Um, Churchill is an ardent imperialist, yeah. ardent imperialist. He is very much in favor of, of the empire and rule Britannia uh keeping india he never wants to let go of india he would keep everything that's in the empire at that moment and expand it if he could yeah that's true that's um, true so i think that also is part of his formulation that's a good point because i think when he finds out later that roosevelt never bought into the idea of the british you know he he knew that the empire was going to have to come to an end and, uh, and this depresses think, him greatly. I don't think he would have been as cozy. You know, I mean, he probably he would have still needed Roosevelt, but I don't know that they would have been as cozy as they were. You know? Well, and this is one of the things that makes him successful as a leader is that uh, he he knows that eventually when when. Um, um, oh my God, I'm just blanking on his name. Chamberlain, when Chamberlain is yeah. deposed. When, when Hitler uh, violates the agreement, expands further, he knows it's over, his political career is at an end, he resigns, and uh, the Tories call for, there's no election, and this is how parliamentary uh, government works in Britain. Right. Um, one guy says he's had, he's thrown in the towel because he's less credibility, we're gonna install our other guy who's the backup. And all those years of uh, crying in the wilderness, uh, his party all realized, He's the man for this moment. He's the only one that saw it. He's the only one that seems to have the, the strength, uh, the fire in the belly, as, as he would say. He really wants to take this situation head on. He's the, we, we couldn't stand him for years. Now's his moment. Bring him in. Even Chamberlain says he's the man for the hour. He, even Chamberlain realized that. Because at some uh, point, the monarch says... Hey, shouldn't I put? Um, oh, I, and I'm drawing a blank on the name now too. But there's a um, there's a a member of the aristocracy that he wants to put in, but he's he's got a guy that would probably have sought a negotiated settlement mm -hmm. with Hitler, mm -hmm. and instead, um, Churchill says, "No, you you bring in Winston." Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so there's it, like several, there's so many turning points here. There's so many possible, you, know, you want to talk about time travel. You want to talk about yeah. influencing a small event, you know, yeah. just changing Chamberlain's voice or mind at yeah. that moment could have had incalculable effects.
Right. So, you, you know, again, that, that surface level understanding of, of Churchill that we have from high school uh, is so very wrong because um, that surface level suggests that it was inevitable. He was always going to be prime minister and he was always going to be a great prime minister. Um, also, most Americans don't know that he suffered a humiliating defeat uh, in his next uh, election attempt and that he made a very uh, uh, ill-advised comeback in the 1950s uh, where he, he did a terrible job as prime minister. So um, this was really a four or five year period in his life where he was the right man for that particular set of circumstances in that moment. Um, and he is. Compare and contrast with a Roosevelt, for example. Right. Uh, Roosevelt is widely hailed as a, as a very competent wartime leader, but he was already a great leader for other reasons in domestic uh, American policy, and, right? And so he, World War II doesn't define uh, uh, FDR. It's just another uh, sheet in his resume. Yeah, and and, it, and he comes to become a wartime leader. He has to evolve into it, you know? Like, right. he doesn't rush into it. Churchill is already ready for it, right? Well, and we, we could argue, and you're more of an expert in this than I am, that uh, Roosevelt is far more concerned about Japanese activity in the Pacific in a looming war oh, yeah. with the Japanese empire. Absolutely. He doesn't particularly want to become involved in this European adventure um, until it becomes clear that the two are actually a, a single war. But here's the point I wanted to make about uh, Churchill and his shrewdness as a politician, that before, before even the phony war begins, he recognizes that uh, when we when we eventually end up in war with Germany, we see it's going to happen. We need the Americans. It's our only lifeline. We'll be destroyed. The Americans are the only way we can survive this. We need we need their assistance. He he reaches out to uh, Roosevelt. He courts him. I mean, and Rick, I think even may use that word. It's like a dating relationship mm -hmm. uh, where they're becoming fast friends. We talk mm -hmm. now about the special relationship. There was no particular special relationship at that no. time at all. In fact, there was a, a large segment of, uh, especially the Amer of the English aristocracy, was anti-American, yes. but also in the middle class and lower class, there was anti-Americanism as well. I was yeah. interested to read that because I assumed there was no particular feeling one way or the other. Um, but there or was. we share a common language and, a, and you were the parent country, you know, and so, of course, we have a special. Yeah. But like you said, there's no there wasn't no. any love lost between the two. No, they didn't see it that way at all. Um, oh. And and uh, modern Americans uh, take the so-called special relationship, which is not nearly as special it used to be for granted. But that really came out of World War Two. It didn't exist before that. That's true. That's very true. So a um, couple things there. The one thing that I wanted to talk about him being like the right person for the right time. You know, one of the great things about writing about Churchill, if you're a writer, if you're Ricks, is that you get to like have Churchill do some of the writing for you. Yes. And Churchill's such a great writer, right? Yes. He yes. Write, I mean, he's written some of the best speeches ever. So here's yes. the one when he gets to be like prime minister, he says, you ask, what is our policy? I will say it is to wage war. You know, by sea, by land and air, with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalog of human crime. That is our policy. Right. What do so, you say to that? Like, it is so. completely clear where Churchill stands. There is no appeasement. And, and that's why it was so necessary, because he's actually arguing from a position of extreme weakness, uh, because Britain has uh, cannot match the um, the industrial might of Germany. Um, well, they're Germany's not already, ready. They're not ready. They don't have uh, they don't have an air fleet. Uh, they're just not ready for this war. It's not a naval in general in Europe. It's not a naval war. Um, so what does he do? What, what, is he, what arsenal does he have? To, what can he offer people? Uh, what he offers them is that fire in the belly, a fighting spirit, and he boosts their morale. That's his greatest function at that point is to boost morale. Plus, he also really grabbed the, grabbed the wheel of uh, his, a micromanager from the way Ricks describes it. He is uh, familiar with how the military works. 
how military chain command thinks. Yeah. So he's unlike unlike an American uh, wartime leader, with the exception of perhaps an Eisenhower. Um, he he knows how to motivate the military and where to skip some steps and get some greater efficiency. That was interesting to me as well because I assume well he's just a politician. You know, politicians don't really guide the military effort, but he he actually did. Yeah, and he was as vice. As, I'm sorry, as Lord of the Admiralty, he was nuts and bolts. Like he was he in the details. Yeah, he put the forces out there. He knew where to launch them from Scapa Flow and tell them to go in the Mediterranean. And Gallipoli was his idea, even though it was a fiasco. Um, you know, but like he, he was a large part of planning that in World War One. Um, but you, all right. So, so like I said, every writer, you know, has that writes about Churchill indulges in, in that. So of course. Uh, that, <clears throat> because we're doing this show, um, I'm going to indulge myself now. And we were talking about accents and I'm going to do my church, my best Churchill for you guys. Do it. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And you know, I'm getting chills just doing that. Could well, you when you're, when you're, when you're little that? island, when your little island is 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 facing down a, a military force that is overwhelming, and it's it's presumed when he gives that talk that an invasion force, a land invasion force, is is coming. Uh, well, at that British point, throughout it's the country still in contention. But yes, I think I think you're right, and and it's um, you know, it gets even worse. And then he gives the speech about you know, never in the field of human conflict is so much been owed to by so many to so After few. After the Battle of Britain, right. And, uh, and, the, you know, and there's a pilot quoted in here who says, I never really thought of it that way until he said that, you know, but then we like kind of were like, yeah, we're at the front line of defense. All right, you know, right. and you brought up the point about the pilots. I the did, and, and this was another, this was another class issue that I, this one really caught me off guard. I had no idea that in the United States, uh, the military is generally regarded to be classless, that it's kind of a uh, it's kind of an equalizer, uh, puts people on an even field. Um, in America, we we pretend we don't have a class structure, even though we really do. It's an, it's an unspoken class structure, whereas the one in England is much more rigid and uh, and um, out in the open. But apparently um, in Britain, particularly at that time, uh, the different branches of the military had class associated with them. So if you were the, if you were the upper crust, you were with uh, the army, which shocked me because I thought, well, wouldn't the upper crust be the Navy? But That's no. what I would have thought. And the Royal Air Force was bottom of the rung, bottom of the barrel, bottom of the ladder, uh, which runs contrary to what you would expect. You would think that uh, pilots, the swashbucklers, uh, requires a high degree of intelligence, uh, usually college education. Um, but no, it, the exact opposite. And for their for for uh, the aristocracy to regard the um, the Royal Air Force pilots as like oh you know they're kind of like uh, the poor slobs, that that really surprised me. I, you would never expect that in in, uh, in the U.S. Um, but class extends apparently to every, or at that time extended to every aspect of British life. Well, not only that, but you were telling me about like, if you were upper crust, you got your own plane. Like you got, you got yes. the, like, you got the same horse, you know, like you didn't yes. just get any old horse. You got your horse, you know? Right. So if you're, if you're, you're, if you're just, uh, George Blow, because George is the most common uh, name in England, I'm given to understand, uh, you took whatever plane was available that day. Um, which uh, surprises me again, because, you know, we're, we're used to seeing uh, American dramas where the pilot's name is already written on the cockpit, <laughs> right? You know, well, this is, this is Pappy Boyington's plane. You know, nobody else flies yeah. this plane. And there's a nickname, you know. And there's a nickname and there's like a the shark, middle, tiger, yeah. tiger mouth on the front and all the rest of it. Uh, but apparently in the RAF, no, it was like, well, there, there, there's a Spitfire over there. Go see if it flies today. 
you know, and that's the one you get. <clears throat> Whereas if, if you, uh, if you knew people, you were, you were more upper crust, uh, then maybe you did have your name uh, stitched into the, you know, or written on the window and you got that same plane every day. Just this morning, I was taking my morning walk and there was a tow truck uh, at the light. And I actually, there's a video. I have to, I have to remember to link the video now. Um, I did a little 15 minute second, 15 seconds short. And on the, on the pasture side of the truck was written right by the pasture window, Sheila. And I'm like, oh, you know, so I walked over and of course there's two guys in the tow truck and I'm like, oh, Which Sheila. One is Sheila. Hey, Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm like, yeah, that's not the name I would have picked for you. But uh, I just thought that was funny. But, but the, yeah, the, the, the pilot's name on the cowling, so, I don't know. Is um, that real? Is that is that a world? War? I mean, I did that happen in World War II in the United States? Did, did you fly your, you know, your I, I Mustang, think so. your P fifty one Mustang, and you that was the one you flew? I think that I think that's always. No, I'm I've never served in the military, but I've seen so many um, so many military aircraft that have the name of the pilot written on the side that I have yeah. to assume that you you always get the same plane. Hmm. I mean, it's like, um, uh, who was I going to? Hey man, Maverick and Goose had their names. On <laughs> so, so this is war. Okay, this is the nascent, you know, days of of military aviation. And obviously, it was World War One, but um, but you know, they're scrambling to make a defense, right? The yes. RAF is ragtag. It's like yes. you know, they do have a, a, a technological advantage. They do have rudimentary radar. Which they puzzles do. the heck out of the Germans. They're like, how are they getting us from behind? The one, uh, the one um, uh, pilot says, you know, I forget. I, I think they actually name him in the book. And, uh, you know, he's like, how did they get behind us so fast? You know? Well, they have, uh, Rick's uh, recounts that they had a, a very disciplined uh, communication system to um, take feedback from a radar station, uh, put it through to a central command station, and get that information back to the pilots who were in the air. The total lag time between what was actually happening in the air and the feedback the pilots would get was five minutes. Wow. So given this is all verbal relay uh, over radio, it's, uh, it's, an, it's, it's an amazing achievement. And um, we take these things for granted now, but the amount of sweat and work and coordination required from all those people to achieve that, that short of a, a gap, it's very impressive. Yeah, no doubt about it. No. And, and, the big is, part, and the big part of how they managed to stave off a German onslaught, also the fact that uh, Germans appeared to be very indiscriminate about what they bombed. They did not, uh, Ricks makes the point that they did not have a very organized um, air campaign. And yeah. he attributes that to the fact that Goering considered himself quite the dashing pilot because I think he had pilot service in World War One. Oh, he did. But, but of course he was, he was uh, like like most officials in, in fascist or authoritarian regimes, you hire cronies and some of the least competent people are the people who bubble to the top. Well, we will smash the like button on the seas and oceans. We will smash the like button in the fields and the hills. We will subscribe to the channel. We shall never Salenda. Okay, so that brings up an interesting point that I have to talk. I mean, we, you know, we have to talk about this because even though this book is a comparative biography of Churchill and Orwell, Ricks goes into great detail about, you know, the especially the early part of, of World War II and the miracle of Dunkirk, right? So hmm. what's going yes, on? Yes, there? yes, you yes. The, Dun what's, the Dunkirk, how did they get away? Very interesting. Yeah, what's going on there? So now I had a new... Um, understanding i had never heard I've, I've heard like seven or eight theories now i have another one that that this book brings up which is that um and this may be revisionist german history but that apparently hitler said after the fact the luftwaffe was going to take care of him, right I, I or somebody says that hitler decided to let the luftwaffe annihilate the 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 um remaining british troops the remaining troops on the beach right and all that the tanks had to do was surround them and i think it's heinz guderian even says like i was parked there for three days 
Mm-hmm. We, we weren't allowed to advance. We had yeah, orders said, not I, to said, advance. I, I, yeah, I had orders Why? to stay where I was. Yeah, like I never heard that before. And I've read about Guderian. I've never seen that anywhere else. I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know where Rick's got that because mm-hmm. I've read several things about um, the yeah, was, was it a main organizational blunder? Maybe new stuff has come out. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I know that um, basically... Um, there was this, like you said, Hitler and Goering were cronies, like they were buddies. So, you know, he, I guess Hitler felt the the German general staff was an obstacle to what he wanted to do at best with the army. And so, but he knew that he could rely on the Air Force because it was a personal buddy of his that was running it. So anything he told him to do, right. he would do. Of course, do. the German military had always- Even if he wasn't it. capable of doing it, the he German promised military to too much. Oh, yes, absolutely. And and the reason he probably distrusted the army was the German in the German military, the army was always staffed by Prussian officers. Yes. Junkers, Junkers who were a, you know, again, the German aristocracy. Speaking of aristocracy, and right? That's and not, Hitler was that's not nowhere his, that's near. That's not his crowd. That's not his crowd. No, he so. was he was from like, he wasn't even from Germany, right? He was from, like, born in Austria right. in a small town right. of, uh, you know, a postal, not was it postal clerk? Is, so it is, could be it could be resentment. There was a minor functionary, not nobody to speak of alcohol. Resentment and him. distrust that, yeah. that uh, caused them to lose the opportunity to annihilate the remnants of the British army at Dunkirk. And then the other theory is that the British really wanted a negotiated settlement with the British because they really wanted to turn east and they wanted to give right the british government away out so so right bye bye churchill here comes chamberlain again and we can talk again you know or that's Lord right he did ra- or whoever he did raise that him. point and to me that actually seems more that seems more believable because if you annihilate the british army there um you're you're going to have a foe you're going to be fighting street to street house to house in 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 britain well you're um, gonna to have to contend with their navy right yeah. so so even if you don't plan to invade um the island proper you're still going to have troubles with you know anything you want to do that involves sea negotiation you know uh, logistics so well we yeah. have to sink the bismarck um yeah that doesn't even come up he doesn't even mention that <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't. He really doesn't talk about the Atlantic, the battle for the Atlantic at all in this book, no. which is astounding to me because other Churchill, well, Churchill himself and other biographies I've read of Churchill, that was the biggest fear that he had was that he had a line. He had a he had a line apparently somewhere in his war room. Got to stay supplied. It had to do with how much tonnage was coming through. Every Don't starve week. the island. And it went below that line for a period of time. And he was extremely worried that they were going to starve. They were going to be starved out. Mm-hmm. So, and that would be that would be the approach you would take if you really wanted to. Uh, kind to of a glaring that. oversight on Rick's part. There, you know, there's it's not the perfect book. It, it has, like you said, it's 30, 300 pages. It doesn't cover everything. And it's hard to cover everything. But Well, um, I, I think the reason that he doesn't... Uh, take into account really pivotal events like the Battle of the Atlantic. We it, already know I, them. It, it's not even so much that I think partially that that it, it can be taken as given that anybody who's going to read this book is, is already broadly familiar with with major events of the war. But he's really trying to get at his theme in this book is how does and he, I watched an interview with him. He says this explicitly. Oh, okay. How does, how does democracy survive? Okay, so and these are through these through the lens of these two men. Here, here are two approaches to the same problem, two ways of viewing the same problem. So I think that's why he leaves out um, and and only includes the stuff that shows how Churchill's unique perspective as not really a warmonger, but yeah, he's 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 a he uh, is an imperialist. He wants to keep the empire together. He's sad about uh, Britain's uh, declining prospects in the in the world, um, but also he's a, he's a man who's unrelenting. And this is what helps democracy survive in in Europe. Whereas Orwell's take from the left is uh, Orwell's deeply concerned about how 
the state can be kept out of the private lives of individuals. So uh, Churchill is, is concerned about preserving um, democratic government. Orwell is concerned about preserving the rights of the uh, of the individual against yeah. an ever encroaching government. Yes, but at no point in this book, see, see, Orwell. It's made clear that Orwell is actually a champion. Uh, he kind of roots for Churchill, right? Which is mm -hmm. unlikely because he, yes. you know, Churchill's upper class and and he's a conservative, you know. And these are, you know, he's about like retaining the status quo for the empire, all the things you just said, why would Orwell be a champion of his? Uh, yeah, and, I, and that's a great point. Um, ordinarily, they would not be uh, bedfellows that you would expect. But it sounds from the description of this book that Orwell feels as many of, uh, of, uh, as many of Churchill's own political compatriots do, that he's the man for the moment, that um, Orwell sees that uh, communism and fascism are two sides of the same coin and that there is no alternative other than to defeat them. Um, and in that, in that sense, he is willing to make common cause with a man like Churchill. And, and I think also, at least I can only infer it from its absence, but I don't believe that Orwell feels that liberal Western liberal democracy is a threat to the individual. The state would not be a threat to the individual. He doesn't, he, he, I think he's more concerned about the, the corruption that's inherent in Stalinist yes. communism, yes. right? He sees that and having come from the left and being wrong. And one of the great things about Orwell is that he realizes when he's wrong and he says it. He says, I've been wrong for two years about this, and now I'm going to tell you why. And you know what I mean? And he's, he can change his political position that is very in light unusual. of new events. That is very, yeah, he has a Bayesian approach to his, his political views. And that when it comes to, you know, politics and religion are the same in that way, that they're deeply held personal beliefs, and that to admit that you're wrong about either of one of those topics uh, makes you question uh, who you are, or who you've been as a person. So it's rare to find the person who is so deeply animated by politics to be able to say, you know what, in light, in light of the new information, I, I have formed a new thesis. It's like um, Ava Gardner effect, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, um, yeah. Uh, it, and he really, uh, Rick's does make it clear that Orwell is a booster of Trish, uh, Churchill. He is a supporter. Yeah. Um, yeah. But he never thinks like, oh, I'm, I'm, going to be there's gonna be a knock at my door and the british police are going to cart me off in the prison no no he's no. like i have a gun because i'm afraid that there may be soviet agents who knock at my door and right. maybe want to get rid of me for my operations all the way back in catalonia you know so like you know that's a completely different thing and so mm -hmm. well that's that's all go ahead that's all i had really so I, I think that um, the only other thing that I would add about this is that they have two very different trajectories at the end of the war. Um, Churchill, his, his greatest moments are at the beginning of the war. His, his diplomatic finesse at bringing the Americans in. Uh, and of course, when Pearl Harbor happens, he knows that he feels confident the war is won. So when you were talking about him courting the United States, even when he gives this speech about never surrender, which I believe is in the spring of 1940, okay, because, before Pearl Harbor. because it's before Pearl Harbor, it's before the fall of France, because mm -hmm. he says, you know, we shall fight in France. Right. And right. Uh, he says at the end of that, the never surrender is not the end, but that's the clip. That's where like, that's the, the, that's the sound bite. That's where everybody edits it. Right. The speech goes on and he says, we shall never surrender. And even if, which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part, of, should I do this, Churchill? This island or a large part of it was subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleets, would carry on the struggle until, in God's good time, the new world, with all of its power and might, steps forth to rescue. 
to the rescue and the liberation of the old. So even in that speech, he's making an appeal. Yeah, to constantly, Americans. constantly. Yeah. Always there. It's always yeah. there. He knows that he needs that arsenal of democracy. He needs yeah. that. You know? Well, there was a there was a, a a kind of a side story that Rick's includes, which was another piece of American history I wasn't familiar with. Uh, who was the um, the American uh, ambassador to? Oh, Joe Kennedy. Joe Kennedy. Oh, we have Joe, to talk about this. Joe Kennedy. Joe Kennedy's a, a, actually a malefactor, and um, I had he's, no idea. He's, he's much like the British aristocracy in that he thinks, "Hey, this Hitler fella, he ain't so bad." And uh, democracy probably overrated, um, oh. and uh, that the best thing and, and Britain is really a waning power. Best thing for Britain is to just throw in the towel, sign a peace treaty, and America should also sign a peace treaty. I wonder if you know. I don't know how much Kennedy, Joe Kennedy, admired Hitler as much as he was fatalistic about what was going to happen. Like he's like, well, Germany's going to win anyway. So you're better off negotiating. He's a pragmatist, you think? I, I mean, that's the way it comes off to me. But he also comes off as just being a jerk. Like he just sounds like a terrible diplomat. Like I so, mean, uh, so if you excuse why, my why French, was, he puts the ass in ambassador. You know, like. So he why just, was he? Why was he ever? And I, I, I'm going to ask you what you think because I, I, I know the answer that Rick's gives. Why do you think that he was ever appointed ambassador? I don't know. Okay, it's because in, in Rick's take, uh, FDR saw him as a political rival uh, uh, and didn't want to run against him. So he'd rather, have, he'd rather have it peeing in the tent or peeing, being in the tent, peeing out than being outside, peeing in. Gotcha. So as soon as FDR was elected to his historic third term, two weeks later, Kennedy yanked as ambassador yeah and and that's a great story so he comes back to america right and 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 he's gonna have dinner with the roosevelt's right at, at uh, new hyde park at, at the at the roosevelt mansion which i've been to it's very nice really and he's gonna spend the weekend there well possibly right so they're gonna have lunch the plan? and he's thinking about inviting him to stay the weekend mm -hmm. and then <laughs> he talks to him for a couple minutes he comes out of the meeting well kennedy think... tells him all these things he's like you know, we should cut a deal with, yeah. uh, with Germany. Yeah. Comes out. He tells his wife, he tells Eleanor, he says, I never want to talk to that blah, blah, blah ever SOB. again. Yep. Get him out. And, and she, yeah, get him out. And, and Eleanor says, but we promised him a tour and, and, uh, and lunch. Yeah. He <laughs> and said, Churchill give, give said, I'm sorry, not Churchill. Roosevelt says, take, Put him in a car, drive around for 10 minutes, give him a sandwich and get him the get blank him out, out of here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, that was the I end. I want to see that portrayed somewhere. I, maybe it was, maybe it's been done before, but like. So in, a, I, um, in a, uh, <laughs> in a talk that Rick's was giving about this book that I watched earlier in the week, um, there was one additional line where he said that, uh, Kennedy would go on to be a thorn in the side of American foreign policy for for years to come after that. So um, I don't I don't know what that's all about, but I I'm don't sure, either because sure I don't. Another interesting book there somewhere. I don't. We don't hear about him in the fifties. I I don't hear about. You don't him hear about him Truman. until his until his son's rising fortunes. Uh, or occur. Eisenhower. I never. I don't hear about him. Yeah. I don't know what that's all about. Um, the. Yeah, that's a blind spot. In my, I'll have to find out something. I, that's a blind spot in my history. Um, I was going to say that the the, the two men uh, have uh, uh, disparate fortunes because um, uh, Churchill's great moment is the time leading up to the war and the beginning of the war. Um, but his his um, his energies diminish uh, yeah. as the war goes on, um, and he also seems to be. Uh, deflated because he recognizes that this is America's war and yeah. that the, the space available to the British in it is really almost polite. And he realizes that they're not, they're not major decision makers. Uh, well, their, their input is sometimes being overridden. They're becoming the junior partner gradually. Correct. And what happens is the American military command comes over and they fail at Castrine Pass. <clears throat> 
And uh, the British said, yeah, we told you about that. And they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. You guys have been fighting for three years. You haven't done anything. Like you haven't won anything. You, you failed at Dieppe. You, you know, you, you, you didn't, you fought Rommel in, in the desert and he ran all over you. You surrendered to Tobruk. You, your, your forces in the East. I mean, you, they didn't say this, but like, this is the attitude. Like, yeah, the British have been here. They've been fighting, but they're not very good. And the British were like, well, these Americans are green. They're not very good. But there's some grudging respect among some of the military, military uh, brass in Britain. And they're like, well, those Americans, they make mistakes, but they learn from them. Right. But they're arrogant because they don't ask us about our lessons that we've learned. They're learning their own lessons, but they learn them quickly. And he, he highlighted one particular meeting between uh, one of the early meetings between uh, British and American military planners. And uh, the Americans were caught flat footed. They, yep. they didn't have the data. They didn't have uh, the numbers or the records at hand. Whereas the British were very businesslike. Here it is, here it is, here it is. Um, and it was embarrassing for the Americans and they didn't let that happen again by, yep. by Rick's telling. So that was part of that, that quick study uh, approach that the British learned to grudgingly respect. Yeah, it was like the one guy said, every time we, we say something, they pull out a darn document you know like every time you know it's like oh yeah here's our study on that um yeah it's 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 an interesting relationship for sure um the um the the numbers are astounding the number of americans that end up being in britain in 1944 you know in the build-up to the invasion it's just yeah and not not particularly welcome uh, i was amazed well how could you i mean like you have uh uh, remember, I mean, we fought a revolution over that, right? The Quartering Act, right? Hmm. So when British troops were in a, on American soil prior to the American Revolution, and they were like, well, we get, they got to stay somewhere. They're staying in your house. Mm-hmm. Like, they're not staying in my house. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yes, they're staying in your house. Yeah, that's the they're law. here to defend you, so they're staying in your house. Yeah. Like, uh, no, thank you. I'm starting to consider becoming a patriot now instead yeah. of the, uh, <laughs> A royalist, you know, like that's not cool. Don't hit me where it hurts, you know. Like so, yeah. yeah. Could you imagine, like, no. all these wonderful, the wonderful British countryside, either being you're erecting like barracks everywhere, or they're sleeping in your house and possibly with your daughter, you know, and or stealing I mean, your girlfriend. What the heck, you know? Yeah. Something's going on, and they've got money. And it was funny. It was like the um, the problem with the Americans. I remember this, this is not in Rick's book. This is something totally different. Um, I forget the source, but look it up, put it in the comments below. Um, the problem with the Americans, one British uh, soldier said, is they're overfed, oversexed, and over here. <laughs> <laughs> and over here. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Our, our reputation for being loud, boisterous, and rude. Uh, Comes from that. Yeah, well, and, and here's the thing. Um, okay. So before speaking of outside things, there's this great uh, series that if you, if anybody's watching, hasn't seen this, uh, you gotta see. And I, and you and I've watched it. It's called war and peace in the nuclear age. Right. Great so sense. I was, so I was trying to remember, um, you know, um, this quote, and it's not in, Churchill and Orwell. And we were talking about how so many things have been misattributed to Churchill, right? Many. Churchill's yeah. like Einstein or yeah. Shakespeare or Mark Twain. Lincoln. Lincoln. If you or Lincoln, you just say something and you're like, just attribute it to one of those five guys. And like, you know, yep. you got a chance that you're right. Cause they said so many things, right? No. So I wanted to check my source on this to make sure I was right. And uh, it was um, when Hitler breaks the pact with Stalin, the non-aggression pact, and invades Russia, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Churchill makes, goes on the air and makes a speech welcoming the Russians to the fight, mm-hmm. right? And uh, there's this guy who is uh, in the British Foreign Service. His name is Sir Frank Ro- Roberts. Great. And it's in, the, it's in the first episode of War and Peace in the Nuclear Age. And it's him talking. So primary source to material. There's, it doesn't get any better than this, guys. Right. It's not a historian talking about it. It's this guy being interviewed by a documentarian. Mm -hmm. And he says on videotape, the guy says, um, he said, um, Hitler, he said, uh, Churchill made this speech, you know, welcoming Stalin to the fight. 
and he said, or the Russians people to the fight. He said privately, he said that uh, if Hitler had invaded hell, he would have welcomed the devil as an ally mm-hmm. against, you know, and, yeah. and uh, it was just funny the way he said that, um, that witticism, that kind of witticism. But but there's one other thing about Frank Roberts that endears me so much. So during the Blitz, during the, um, you know, the the, the Luftwaffe bombings of London, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of damage. So he talks about this one incident. And uh, if, I'll, if I can, I'll pull it out and I'll put it into the video. But he says, um, you know, we were walking after uh, the air raid sirens had gone. You know, they all clear had been sounded and we're walking and there was this church. That had been bombed and um there was a policeman standing guard you know front looters or people going through and getting hurt or whatever and uh he said i'm walking with my wife and she said these these are frank roberts words i'm not insulting his wife he said she said he, she said rather stupidly as one does at times like this um what's happened officer he said in the chap was very he's tall and my wife's very short he leaned over he said mice <laughs> how british is that <laughs> very, very. <laughs> That's to funny. minimize it you know to just yeah yeah to minimize it and and make humor absurdist humor i i know it's uh you gotta, just love it just love i'd it. love to think that i could be uh so clever in such dire circumstances when the country's being bombed from above and there's not much you can do about it but um so Churchill's powers are, are waning. He's, he's a bit of a drunk. Uh, his ability to consume alcohol is legendary. Well, that's interesting because the guy who replaces Joe Kennedy has to go to find out if he is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? Isn't that one of his missions is to find out if Churchill's a drunk? Right. And I don't know that that's determined. He uh, says that when uh, the ambassador's name escapes me, but he says when the ambassador writes back to... Um, Hopkins. Hopkins is the name. When Hopkins writes back to Roosevelt, cables him or whatever, and says, um, you know, he looked at me with a clear eye and he said, and he said, and I think that, you know, Rick says, I think that clear eyed description went a far away to, yeah. to say, exonerating him. We can trust this guy. Right, right, right. He's yeah, saying that would, he's that would be right a now. legitimate concern based on uh, rumors that you heard uh, because. Uh, throughout the book, it's in, a, in every book I've ever read about him. It's repeated uh, just how much he would drink at, at the beginning of the day, the middle of the day, the end of the day, uh, and how he managed to absorb all that and, and one not die and two be sober enough to get things done is uh, uh, there must have been something something slightly unique about his metabolism. I don't know, but um, so anyway, this this begins to catch up with him a bit, and the he, he sees the. Uh, the end of, of British dominance, and he has to preside over that as, as national leader, which is very hard for him. Um, and then, of course, at the end of the war, he he suffers a humiliating uh, uh, rebuke from oh the my gosh public. Here's the man who is who has been our steadfast uh, guide through the war, uh, the light that we followed, and uh, the man who uh, bolstered our sagging spirits. But uh, yeah, we don't want him. The war is not even over yet. The war in Europe has ended, but VJ Day hasn't happened yet. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's I have to, cut I, off. I have to attribute prime. that. It's got to be another very British thing because it would be hard to imagine uh, the, the American polity at that time um, abandoning the equivalent of an FDR. No, FDR had to die. That was the only way. There was no way that FDR was ever going to be elected out of office. He would have been an American Caesar, you know, like he would have been some some weird. I mean, the fact that that um, that FDR is elected for four terms and we could we could go on. Well, this is why we have a constitutional amendment now. (laughs) Yeah, you just can't. That that cult of personality thing just has not good. You can't. And we Um, we knew that apparently we came together and uh, all agreed that that was not a good thing. It's the it's the thing. It's it's it's, um, you know, it's like. Demo- it, it, you know, democracies, th- we need opposition. We need that opposition part. You have to have two diverging points of view. You, it's the duty of, of a strong opposition to exist. Mm-hmm. You know, right. you have to be there and you ha- you're, a, you're a player. And in parliamentary uh, governments, 
that's widely known. In, in the American two-party system, that, that is becoming less acceptable to some people who think, I mean, but we can see Orwell warns us of the danger of the one-party system. Correct. He warns us clearly about this. Yep. You know? Absolutely, and, that, and that's his, his critique of, of communism. Um, and so to wrap up Churchill, Churchill is, is his greatest moments are during the war. Um, he is a, a less of a figure towards the end. He has kind of an ignominious end before the war is even concluded. Um, and Orwell is on a different trajectory. He's, his trajectory is actually upward because he's been a middling writer of no great fame or note um, and really hasn't even written anything that amazing. I mean, Rick says there, he, he likes some of his uh, things like Ode to Catalonia uh, and one or two other things, but he's more enamored of his essays. Um, but of course, his greatest notoriety comes post-war in writing uh, first Animal Farm and then um, uh, 1984, um, which came out, do you remember what year 1984 was published? It was the late um, 40s. I was can find not? out right here. I have the book. I'm thinking 48, something like that. Sounds about right. Oh, one last thing about Churchill before we yeah. gloss over. He wore, I, I did not know this, but it, I found out that he wore um, pink silk uh, underwear when he was at the way. <laughs> why Rick's, not be comfortable? Why not be Rick's, comfortable? Rick tells me that. Yeah, but why pink? I pink that was is not a choice. I would agree. 1949. Animal Farm is 45, and uh, yeah, and and uh, so I'm off by you. Four is 49. Um, so yeah, uh, the, the and this is again where the the two comparisons uh, are not really obvious as to why you have these two folks together. Um, Churchill's impact on the world doesn't really extend beyond World War II. Uh, well, maybe no. No, you don't. So, think so he gives that great speech. It ends up being in St. Louis. He probably gave it a lot of places from Trieste, in the Baltic. To, yeah. mm -hmm. You got it. You got it. <laughs> and from Captain in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic. There you go. And Iron Iron Curtain, Curtain, Curtain has descended over the continent. Also, uh, he has another speech where he talks about. Um, uh, I think he's in Parliament. He may be. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's in War and Peace in the Nuclear Age, so I can probably pull it out. But he says, um, you know, he's, I can actually see him like doing this. And he says, mm -hmm. um, uh, Europe, I, I don't know if he says Western Europe. He says, Europe um, would be communized like Czechoslovakia and London under bombardment, certainly, were it not for the deterrent power of the atomic bomb in the hands of the United States. So, so, cause that's what that documentary is all about. I was gonna say that's, that's the, that's the setup for the rest of the show. Yeah, that's, that's what it's all about. And, um, and that's where we learned our lesson, right? So that's Munich, right? So we all would do not deal with an aggressor. You do not, you know, that's, that's where that, that whole, that thing comes from. Yeah it's a lesson that we learned, you know, and we applied to our, to our, um, so, so at the end, Churchill becomes a, a, a mouthpiece to that non appeasement of an aggressor and Orwell warns of the totalitarian state. So at the yes. end, they do merge. Now I don't know That's if Rick true. makes that point. No, he doesn't because I jumped to that because I know a little bit more about the fifties. It, it would have been good if uh, if he had made that tie to bring them back together again. I, I think that's a that's a really good connection. Um, Rick isn't a bad writer. Oh, I think he's a uh, leaving leaving the the dots and connecting them aside. Yeah, I really enjoy reading his prose. I, think I like his prose. I think he's a very skilled writer. I, very clear. I, I enjoy very clear. I enjoy reading his words, and I, I think that he probably took his inspiration from another Orwell work, which is one of his other famous pieces, at least to students of writing, which is do you right. Remember, remember what it's called? I can't. No, it. but it's like a style book, and he talks it, about here's what you should do if you're a writer. Ten things. Put it on your on your writing above on the wall next to your writing desk. Every yeah. student should, uh, not student, every student, every professional, everybody who has to write for any significant audience 
uh, would do well to pay attention to Orwell's admonitions. And I, I really get the sense that uh, Rick's really praises it. And I think it, I think it was very influential for him. Yeah, which, I get the which, feeling. Which I think too. explains the style of prose that he has, which I like very much. Yeah. Um, like Hemingway for me was the guy who taught me the short sentence, you know, mm -hmm. because I love to read Fitzgerald and I love those flowery, long, you know, paragraph long sentences mm -hmm. and uh, and showing off that I knew how to use words from the English language. I think a lot of writers start that way. But then you realize the, the, the skill that's involved with brevity. And so, you know, Hemingway brought me was like the, the razor, you know, the, the, the sword, you know, slash through the Gordian knot or whatever. But it was like, you know, tie this together and this and look how beautiful, blah, blah, blah. And now smash that down. You don't need all that stuff. Yes. So every writer needs that kind of editor. And so it looks like Orwell was that kind of. Or, or in other words, writer. in other words, you might say, you must unlearn what you have yeah. learned. It's so true. Uh, but I, I would argue that he had, Orwell's had a more lasting impact and, and Rick's make, really makes the, the case that um, when Orwell died, he was largely an unknown writer. Um, he was certainly not, uh, none of his works are considered part of the Western canon. Um, but as time gone, has gone on, his, um, his notoriety has done nothing but increase and increase and increase. And perhaps this is a, a, a warning to us that the fact that he is so cited and referenced uh, in the last 20 years and in, with increasing frequency now is an indication that people are looking to him for some kind of wisdom and guidance because they, they feel what's coming. And a, a, an indication of that is when the previous uh, president was elected, Everybody reached for 1984 because uh, a lot of literate folks felt what was coming uh, and reacted in horror and were looking for some kind of uh, consolation or guide to navigate through it. And I will tell you that um, while I've seen 1984 produced as a stage production, mm -hmm. I've never read it. Mm -hmm. I went to buy a copy. You couldn't. Okay, from Amazon. Sorry to, really? sorry to, sorry to admit that I would uh, use Amazon. Um, they, they were out. Well, you don't like launching billionaires into space? I don't know. No, I'm not so keen on that. Huh. Um, Did you hear they, about they, the 18 year old that he took with them who said, uh, you know, I've actually never bought anything off of Amazon? Really? Like, did you tell him that before or after the launch? He said <laughs> that. Wow. I don't know. Well, it was I, on, I knew he took a it kid. Was, it was out there in the ether. I don't, I can't verify the source on that, but let's assume that it's true. I like it. It, it would be a funny, it would be a funny iron, ironic thing for an 18 year old. To say. It would be, but for the fact for, for a, a major worldwide distributor like Amazon to be fresh out of all copies of 1984 uh, at that particular moment, that tells you about Orwell, Orwell's lasting impact and, and that he's, he's a touchstone for these fears of the incursion of the state. Did, so did you ever see the movie? No. No, with John Hurt and Richard. I, you know, Burton. I've seen bits and pieces, but I have never watched it straight through. Well, you know, um, have some happy pills or something like your favorite dessert ready afterwards. It is so depressing. That's why I never watched it. And the stage, the stage production was as well. And it's, it's uh, you know, there's torture. It's bad. The, it's it, psychological torture. And the book is worse. So like, yeah. here's the problem with picking up 1980. In my, this is my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. In picking up 1984 as a guidebook of yeah, what to really do, bad. it doesn't work. No, okay? it's a warning. It's bleak. There is no hope at the yeah. end. At the end of the, I'm not, I, I just ruined the story for you. Oh, there no. Is, there is no hope. So, so you're saying there's no room for like a 1985, maybe it takes place in a different city this time. 2010. Yeah. It's like 2010. Right. Um, the happy, the, All happy the characters you've back. come to love, they're mm. back and wackier than ever. <laughs> the torturer in room 101 <laughs> or whatever it was called. Was it 101? I don't know. I forget, but there's significance to the number for some reason. Uh, it's in the book. Rick's writes about it. Now I forget. Oh, and it. also Rick's points out the fact that the main character is named Winston. Yes. So this is another indication that I Orwell never made that connection. Well, why would you? Because he actually points this out that um, Winston is not a 
it's not a first name in England. There were no Winstons. Uh, he must have gone and researched this. He said he said he asserts there were no there were no Winstons living uh, in England uh, when 1984 was written, other than Churchill himself. Oh, interesting. Uh, so I don't know if that's true. That's really I, interesting. But he really I, believes that it, that he's patterning him or, or naming him for a. Uh, Someone he reveres. He also asserts at the beginning of the book that uh, in his foreword, almost, or the very first chapter, he says that um, it is known that um, Churchill read 1984 twice. I believe that. So I believe I that. I don't know how he knows that. He doesn't say. He, um, well, he may have, he may have either uh, written that in his, his voluminous writings, or he may have said it to somebody who wrote it down because... I'm with Churchill. I'm going to write down everything he says. Maybe I can get a book out of it. It's a good point. So here's the thing with, with Animal Farm, and, and this is a point that Ricks makes, which is a great point I never really thought about. Animal Farm is a fairy tale, right? It's even subtitled a fairy tale, right? Right. 1984 is a horror story. It is, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not... Um, um, it's I, it, yeah, it becomes a cautionary tale, but it's really designed to um, to to frighten, you know. And he said this is in a in a uh, um, book talk that he gave that I, that I watched from 2019, um, where he he compares and contrasts Animal Farm as a fairy tale versus uh, 1984, which he also calls uh, a horror story. He says it's it's the uh, the 20th century version of Frankenstein. Yeah, he compares it, and he says that in the book as well. I mm -hmm. think. Yeah, yeah. So, except yeah. it's not uh, <clears throat> an invention of modern science, but it is an ideological invention, and that's the thing. It is so, not So back to the point I wanted to make long before we were talking about these macroeconomic systems, right? Over the course of history, there's this idea or there was, I don't know what the prevailing idea is because I haven't been to a university in ages <clears throat> of history, but there was this idea that like economic systems evolve as mankind evolves, as humankind evolves. So there was feudalism, there was mercantilism, there was, you know, there was um, uh, capitalism. There was uh, like this, you know, rampant capitalism and then it becomes tamed, you know, uh, some of the, 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 you know, child labor is and uh, working seven days a week is no longer right. and then and then it sputters in the 30s during the depression and that something new must come along mm -hmm. to replace it and that ideal was there <clears throat> churchill didn't have that churchill realized and and there's another quote that is not in this book and i do not know if it's true or just attributed but i love it it's attributed to churchill which is you know <clears throat> democracy is the worst form of government except for except all for all government. the others yeah and even if he doesn't say that it makes sense that he might say that because yeah. it is an evolving experiment it's been an experiment since ancient greece it was an experiment then in you know and 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 it's still an experiment um and it's evolving um into what we don't know. We can look at Scandinavian countries and say it may involve some kind of socialism. We can we can uh, look at um, you know I, you know I don't know. I'm not a great at a political economic theory, but well, you, I would I would be uh, skeptical of whatever you would say anyway because predicting the future is notoriously fraught. It's right. pretty much impossible, um, and any any prediction you're going to make is based on uh, historical precedent. And um, usually it doesn't apply because and that's there, are, exactly, there, are new, there are new factors. There are always exact, new factors. And that's exactly why 1984 doesn't work as, as a way to predict the future. It just yeah. doesn't. Well, was, no, and Rick's makes this, this case uh, that Orwell's concern is the intrusion. How, do you, how does one maintain freedom, uh, particularly freedom of thought, with an intrusive surveillance state? What he did not foresee right. was surveillance capitalism. Yeah, it's not. It's not even the state you have to worry about right now. It's uh, corporations. Corporations know everything about us. We buy their products, which 
um, capture all of our information, can track where we are, what we're doing, when we do it. Um, we volunteered all this information and it's, it's, a, it's a reverse of Big Brother. Big Brother's not trying to get in. We invited him in and he's here right now. Um, and it's not so much he's trying to control us. It's a matter of us radiating all of our information out to the world to then be used for whatever purposes it's going to be used for. So I, I, um, I heard recently, I don't think it was in this book, but I heard recently somebody say, if, um, if the app is free, you're the product, you're the product. Correct. Right. Yep. And that is so true. And, and, and the, um, the idea that um, if you talk to us in 1984, as idealistic, you know, at that age, say slightly like anarchistic, not in a political way, but like in an attitude, like, yeah, you know, yeah. just like, leave Horses. your hands off of me. I'm, I'm young. I want to do things. <clears throat> Don't touch my stuff. Yeah. Um, if you said I was going to carry a brick around with me, that would anyone would be able to track my movements or that I would wear something on my wrist, which I don't, but that would track my heartbeats and my location, whether or not I was stressed, whether or not my heartbeat was irregular, you know, like I'd say, you you got me out of your mind. I would never wear a device like that ever. Lots of Now we're lining up to pay people for the privilege to do that. (laughs) Correct. Correct. And, and so on the one hand, you have volunteering to bring this technology into your home, into your life. Uh, but at the same time, society is now constructed in such a way that you cannot be a fully participating member right. unless you do that. I realized if, this recently. If, if you say, uh, so for instance, I was one of the last people to ever get a cell phone back when they were still flip phones. Um, and I would tell everybody that, well, why don't you have one? Everybody's got one. I'm like, I want to have, I want to have a, a real excuse to not be contacted. You know, and once you have the cell phone, there's never, you, there's never any valid excuse for not being reachable. I want to be not reachable sometimes. Right. Um, of course that was back when it was a, just a flip phone, a dumb phone, didn't do anything. It wasn't connected to the internet. You can still be tracked by cell towers and whatnot, but it's, you know, big data, it wasn't was being, harder. Yeah. big data wasn't being harvested the way it is now. And now, um, you know, to gain entree to all the social media that we want to use, we have to, we have to supply bits of information. We, we unknowingly authorize the, the collection of all sorts of other data that you would have to dedicate your waking hours from the minute you get up until, until you go to sleep at night to keep track of it all. It's overwhelming. You can't do it. Even if you're a smart person, you can't do it. So it's kind of a, you, you kind of give in. Um, and you say, well, they've won. And you just hope that you have uh, made yourself a very small target. 